welcome everyone. This is um, Empowering Women for Excellence Initiative STEM special event. As you've seen that uh, this uh, session is being recorded throughout today. So thank you for giving your consent for that to happen. We are kicking off as we want to respect uh, everyone's time and ensure that we can cover what we would like to cover today. Um, so the first thing that we will be doing is I'm going to give you an idea of who is who is here and um, just basically the kinds of numbers that we have uh, in attendance today. So we have had more than 100 uh, participants register for these, uh, this event. Uh, our gender disaggregation at this point is uh, 34 female and 81 males. Ladies, I wanna see you shine and obviously uh, encourage others to, to get involved. We have 13 countries that will be represented during this event. I mean, and just really diverse countries from China to Indonesia, Jordan, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Vietnam, um, even Australia. And uh, we have a huge number that are from, obviously from Nigeria, where Empowering Women for Excellence Initiative is, is uh, headquartered. And we have people from Abuja, Adamawa, Edo, Gombe, Kaduna, Kwara, Lagos, Ogun, Ondo, and Oshun states. Uh, we have at least 12 educational institutions represented. And from NGOs and companies, we have about 90 uh, people represented. So we're hoping that our colleagues will join us. Uh, we understand obviously that, um, that there are connection issues and all kinds of issues uh, that are going on with, um, with the internet. So. Uh, rest assured, we, we understand that and we're asking that you just uh, hold on and, and keep with us throughout the course of the session. The first thing that we will be doing is to go over our agenda for today, okay? So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what we will be doing together today. Um, I will go into introductions a little bit uh, later. So I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what on earth we're doing today together. Um, so as I said, this is a STEM special event. It's one of our programs that are offered uh, by Empowering Women for Excellence Initiative. It's powered by EWI and supported by InnoSci. You will hear a lot more about both organizations as we go on. And obviously the, the session is cybersecurity and how the youth can gear up to acquire skills in this field. So we are starting off with welcomes, introductions and uh, our opening poll, we'll do it in a few minutes. Uh, you will then be watching a very short video about what EWI can do for you. And then we will have a word from InnoSci and uh, then we'll get straight down to business. Now it's going to be very much, um, yes, it's gonna be interactive, but know that there's a lot of information that you'll be taking in today. So the presentations and some interaction, we will also have breaks in between and one big break, and then we'll get back to business. So we continue why we are here. And then after that, uh, we will have our closing poll and remarks from both NSI and EWI. So it's gonna be four exciting, engaging hours. And I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, I would like to share, um, just welcome our special guests. Um, first of all, I'm going to share my screen again. <laughs> and uh, obviously this is something you have seen as you registered for this event. We have as our special speaker, Dr. Sanjay Vaid. I hope I got that correct, the second, the second name. And uh, he's obviously a cybersecurity expert and regional sales director of HCL Technologies for the Nordic countries. 
And when he comes up, he will be telling you a lot more about himself. But all you need to do, basically need to know is he has multiple and multiple certifications in this field and years of practice. His certifications include from uh, the famous MIT and other institutions. And he will certainly be telling you more about himself as we go along. I would like um, Eunice to please uh, introduce herself uh, just with the, maybe in one sentence. And uh, of course, we'll get back to what Inosai does. Yeah, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Eunice Amon Moflik. Um, I am the founder and uh, program director of Inosai. Um, we are uh, a company and as well as an organization that is based in, uh, in Norway. And what we are doing is bringing, um, democratizing, um, how do you call it, STEM, in a way that it can reach the youth as early as possible so that you can make the best choices in uh, going forward. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Eunice. Uh, so my name is Sophia Ibn Garba, founder and program director of Empowering Women for Excellence Initiative. As I said, headquartered in Nigeria. And uh, very shortly, you'll be able to see a video of what it is that we do uh, as an organization. But generally, I can say that our mission is uh, to provide empowerment and enlightenment for girls and women uh, through multi-sectoral interventions. We will just go straight ahead to watching uh, a short video and then Inasai again will speak or maybe we can just go first to Inasai. Uh, would you like to just spend those, may I, have, I think I can um, shuffle it around since I've been speaking. Um, Eunice, just a little bit more about Inasai, what kind of services, uh, how people can benefit from what Inasai does. Uh, mute. You're on mute. Yes, <laughs> the famous uh, phrase. <laughs> yes. So I would say that for Inosai, we are focused on youth. And what we are looking at is how can we actually um, address uh, the difficulties that, um, that prevents the acceleration of expert industry skills and professional job performance in Africa. Um, what we are looking at is how can we use STEM in a way to bring, um, to bring um, enough skills, industry skill sets such that you can be able to um, get jobs wherever they are, irrespective of the, uh, the continent on which they are. And, and that's where we, we come in. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, be on this with uh, Sophia. Um, we met, I met Sophia in a conference and I thought this is a wonderful thing she's doing. We are so also focused on women because we know that women can bring change. And when they bring change, it doesn't just affect them. Uh, the impact is not just for them, but all the people around them. And that's what we are, we are engaged in. Um, I think that's all I'll say for now. And, and then we go on, yeah. Thank you so much, Eunice. Uh, so what we're going to do now is watch a very, very short uh, video and uh, we'll take uh, the next steps after that. One second, I will be sharing my screen for this.
Okay. So that's a very short video, uh, just saying a little bit about what we do as Empowering Women for Excellence Initiative. Uh, we are going to proceed with our poll just to get a sense of where we all are in terms of knowledge. And um, let's take a look. I'm launching a poll right now, and I would like you to please just take a few minutes complete it. Can everyone, uh, Uchi, can you confirm that the poll is visible? So we're just going to give a few minutes for this. Okay. We're just going to let the poll, um, looking at how many have voted. It's interesting to see we have a majority of our, those who've joined us already from uh, Asia and Africa. I'm just going to let it run for another 30 seconds because not everyone has completed. And we still have people coming in. And uh, anyway, it would be a representative sample. So that's absolutely fine. Okay, we're going to take a look and this is going to be very helpful for our guest speaker to see where we're at. Just open that up. So you can see the results. So we have uh, knowledge rates are medium and low and none at all, which is absolutely fine. That's why we're here. Uh, we agree. Oh, extremely relevant takes the um, it takes, that's that's really good to know that we think uh, cybersecurity is very relevant. We have almost uh, equal split between taking precautions. That's very interesting to see. And no one says that there's nothing to be aware about. So that's also very encouraging. Ladies almost there. We still have the males ahead. And again, as I said, most of our, our those that are joining us today are from Africa, and uh, we also have Asia. This is excellent. So uh, we are going to do the same at the end of the session. And I am going to stop talking <laughs> and just give the floor to, I'm just going to close this, give the floor to Sanjay, um, over to you. Hi, um, my name is Sanjay Ved, uh, and it's a pleasure to be speaking here. Um, I am originally from India, based now in Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, I have some 24 years of experience uh, and uh, had the pleasure to work for Africa region uh, in my previous assignment, uh, uh, and uh, it was uh, a privilege. Uh, otherwise, I work in the United States, uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and Middle East, uh, and Russia and CIS countries in these 24 years, um, and uh, have predominantly worked in the technology industry area, uh, in the IT area, uh, and satellite communication and product design uh, area for governments, uh, uh, defense, and private sector. Uh, and research and development organizations. I have studied from MIT Sloan uh, and uh, from Indian Institute of Foreign Trade, uh, Indian Institute of Management, uh, as well as uh, from University of Salford, where I did my master's from, uh, 
and I have studied uh, also from Columbia Business School uh, and some other uh, universities as well. I am a Certified Information Security Manager, ECISM, from ISACA, which is one of the bodies in cybersecurity area. Uh, I am also a Certified Incident Handler from EC Council uh, as well. And then they have other, other certification I have. I'm also a CMI Level 7 Consultant, which is the highest level in consulting from Chartered Management Institute, London. I am also a Certified Coach uh, uh, as well. And uh, those are some of uh, my credentials to be uh, you know, uh, be able to talk about this particular area. Currently, I had the Nordic region for HCL technologies for cybersecurity and risk. Nordic con consists of Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland. And HCL is a $10 billion organization with around 175,000 employees uh, and is a leader among the top five companies in the world in the IT security and IT area. I have a presentation prepared uh, for this particular forum and which I will share now. So our agenda is security and how the youth can get up to acquire the skills in this field. The agenda which we have includes uh, the trends in cybersecurity, which are very relevant because this is this and technology is one area which is ever evolving. Cybersecurity solutions that are available, uh, cyber bullying, which is very very important. I'll also talk about cyber ethics, which is very important. Most of you are students, and it's important to be a good uh, citizen, global citizen, and corporate citizen and an ethical one. Uh, skills in cybersecurity, hard and soft skills, how do you acquire these skills and the jobs in cybersecurity? With that, I'll move into the first slide. This is uh, Dame Dido Harding, the CEO of TalkTalk. Talk. She was breached uh, uh, some time back, her organization, and um, she has uh, you know, uh, following things to share that uh, you know, we have, we have as, as for security, we keep on building our walls higher and higher because uh, these cyber criminals are building longer and taller ladders uh, and we need to keep uh, pace with that. What it implies is cybersecurity is an ever-changing goalpost. It is not consistent and you have to consistently adapt to the adversary. Some of the cybersecurity trends further include that uh, PwC has protected 55% of the enterprise security, plan to increase their cybersecurity budgets in uh, this year. And 50%, 51% are adding full-time cybersecurity staff. So there is a lot of headroom to grow, uh, a lot of potential in this space. PwC's latest survey finds 96% of exec executives had shifted their cybersecurity strategy in COVID-19 and 40% of the executives say they are accelerating digitalization. Uh, that's again a good news as, as far as security and digitalization is concerned. IDC expects uh, that the worldwide security spending would reach to 174.7 billion, which was in 2000, till 2024, with a compound annual growth CAGR of 8.1% over 2020 and 2024. IDC further predicts cybersecurity will be the largest and fastest growing segment uh, in the security market, accounting roughly to overall spending throughout 2020 and 25 forecasts, uh, attaining a 10.5% CAGR in five years. Funding for non-US headquarters cybersecurity company will increase by 20% in 2021, according to Forrester, uh, prediction of 2021 and analyst Mason predicts mobile device security will be the fastest growing cyber security category of all, uh, attaining to 17% CA.
is requiring secure e-commerce more and more because of lockdown uh, e-commerce and uh, digital commerce has taken place and hence attacks like man in the middle attack uh, remote access uh, security because most of the sessions are remote regulatory compliance have become used high mobile usage is high uh, now more people use mobile internet bandwidth are available uh, and they do uh, shopping and uh, transactions over the mobile and that requires secure identity access uh, for the users encryption malware protection and regulation so that the transaction is secure and also it is susceptible because mobile can be used at home as well as in office or in unsecure location over uh, unsecure wifi connection as well which can put both the user and the organization into some form of risk then we have industry 5.0 uh, this year we move from industry 4.0 to 5.0 uh, which means that apart from big data artificial intelligence machine learning we now have the fourth element which is human uh, covid has brought digitalization not just in it but in ot as well ot means operational technologies plant machineries oil and gas mining sites so more and more adoption of technologies for like iot Uh, sensors, operation technology, security, which is for the SCADA system, programmable logical controller (PLC), uh, and uh, the DCS distributed control system. Others are on rise. Uh, secure access is becoming important because more and more access are are remotely. Take for example, in the malls in your countries, which might have elevators. The maintenance in a lockdown situation for those elevators are remote, right? and hence these can be also breached and there are so many other scenarios in factories and other places in oil rigs within the sea middle of the sea uh, or the mining sites so secure access is very important monitoring becomes very important because some sites might be unmanned or some sites might require uh, uh, you know uh, a lot of effort in terms of traveling to those sites and safety requirement especially offshore sites in middle of the sea in case of uh, rigging uh mining sites uh, etc and africa has a big uh, big portion of its economy which is towards energy oil gas and mine uh and then of course manufacturing itself uh, has and pharmaceutical itself has a lot of requirement for these as well and so does it the other is cloud we have seen platform as a service infrastructure as a service software as a service on rise with google microsoft azure and uh, uh aws on the rise more and more companies are moving to public and private cloud and that is requiring security in form of key management for authentication of the users identity and access management to give the right people the right access and controls shadow it and shadow data that means with let's say office 65 you don't just get uh, the corporate access but there will be uh, personal office 65 access as well uh there will be dropbox there will be sharepoint folders where data can be uploaded and downloaded so the shadow it is created who is accessing what data and where it's getting uploaded is very important so cloud dlp cloud azure access security broker become very essential solutions to be put on cloud as well and then cloud also needs to be monitored because it's a third part so that's another reason for cyber security and ai and then then application if you are going to have a machinery controlled by a mobile or a tablet if you are going to have uh, access on banking through your phone uh, or tablet then there will be applications these applications have to be secured and these application will have a journey of getting it developed this journey you know what happens typically is when application gets developed if you get a bug at the end of the journey then you have to redo the whole development which is quite time consuming and uh, costly to company so there is something called devsecops where you shift left shift left means you don't do testing at the end only you do it throughout the proce process so it's continuous integration so devsecops has come in the concept of container has come in for the speed so that uh, you know there are containers from the whole ci cd pipeline which are used for applications and these containers have to be secured and then the automation process has to be done for various branches of code getting developed the version control system has to be automated and this further requires security and iot itself is another element all of these effects are leading to a high demand 
in the area of cybersecurity. Now, why do we find, what are the challenges uh, we are finding uh, in this uh, area and in this domain? We are finding these challenges where the perimeter is disappearing. People no longer work from the office. They're working from home. They're working from airports. They are working from cafeterias. Uh, and again, uh, you know, there was traditional data center. Now it's gone to cloud. Uh, applications are residing on Microsoft uh, uh, cloud. So that is the parameters are is disappearing and have no real time insight into cybersecurity. Uh, for power of cyber criminals in the sense they're using artificial intelligence. The three categories of attackers, there's the recreational attacker, there is the syndicate, and then there is the state sponsored attack. Now there are, as you have IT service providers, there are companies which provide offer platform to launch cyber attacks. And these companies provide uh, sophisticated artificial intelligence, machine learning, and different platforms for the attackers to launch the attack. And this uh, provides an edge to the cyber crim criminal, which can be at times go undetected because they're so sophisticated. Also, cybersecurity, as I mentioned, is an evolving process. There is a lack of skills because there's a lot of catching up to be regularly done. It's like running on a treadmill without uh, stopping the treadmill ever stopping. Uh, so you have to have you know skills which are redeveloped. Uh, and then there are vulnerabilities which are which have to be identified and you have to be, have the capability to mitigate them. Lack of budgets, uh, you know, uh, some companies don't have threat intelligence program. And as as uh, I gave the, the analogy in the beginning, the walls of the attackers or the, the ladders of the attackers to climb the wall of the organization security is rising. And the organization also need to increase their budgets accordingly. And then this thing has got disrupted as well because of COVID where the whole model where people used to come to office and you had everything prepared under the roof for security is got uh, disrupted because now suddenly people who are inside that DMZ data demilitarized zone are sitting outside the demilitarized zone and accessing the data within the demilitarized zone and data uh, elsewhere on the cloud as well. The lack of agility is another reason security operating center have moved from simply incident and event management to a correlation uh, and then security orchestration and automation response uh, and uh, user enterprise behavior. To give you an analogy, analogy in 1995, uh, almost, uh, sorry, in 2005, almost 95% of the attacks were from outside. That means somebody will attack your network and hence companies put firewalls, IPS, IDS, antivirus in place. Come 2020, where 60% of the attackers are from insider. And why is it so? Because insider have their own digital life. They have life on Facebook, they have life on LinkedIn, they carry their device outside, they have their own mobile devices, and they are susceptible to social engineering where somebody can lure them into accepting an email. They believe that person is something they, they, they trust. Or there can be identity theft, the mobile phone, which has credentials might be going into an insecure internet area or a cafe where it might have got compromise and hence compromising the identity of the user. So there are so many ways in which the insider threat can affect the security of the organization. And then there is another area which is cyber threat, uh, uh, which are multiplying. There's so many ways in which, uh, uh, in which the, uh, the, uh, in which the attacker can attack an organization as well. And, uh, it can be from the OT side of it. It can be the IT side of it as well, or IoT side. So there, this particular landscape, uh, both from the external and internal, is, is a challenge which we have today in cybersecurity. And what are the 10 future threats which we are looking? Uh, negligent insider, insider not aware. Insider means the employee of the company, not aware about security policies. Uh, things they should do or not, and accepting uh, emails from people they should not be accepting or believing them to be the ones uh, who they trust. And then, of course, social engineering. 
APT attacks, which are advanced attacks on the organization, uh, targeted attacks, zero attacks, which means there are no signatures for detection of those attacks, cyber attacks itself, uh, zero day attacks, uh, known software vulnerabilities uh, are uh, another area. Uh, we have uh, something like WannaCry, the advanced version or uh, you know, uh, updated version of those malware as well. Malicious insider, that means there is an insider who is, uh, who is a threat to the organization itself and is continuously trying to breach the organization from inside. Uh, social engineering, as I mentioned, uh, everybody now has a live on Facebook, on LinkedIn, uh, and uh, that can be a way in which people can create a proxy account of somebody the person knows and asks them to do something which can harm the organization. Distributed denial of service where you flood the organization with attacks uh, and uh, their bandwidth is choked in terms of communication or internet uh, and hence uh, crippling their availability of services. Brute force attack is an attack where the passwords can be hacked and once the adversaries has the access to the password, they can launch an attack on the organization. And phishing attacks, these are the attacks which uh, are over emails. You get an email uh, from somebody you believe you know, uh, there might be alphabets which can be changed and A which looks like A can be uh, having a little difference uh, in that there can be some form of change in the email address from the user. It might be a legitimate email address, but very subtle change. And it might have an attachment uh, or, a, or content in it, which might have malware load, uh, loaded in it or advanced malware loaded in it, which will, the, the idea is to get it uh, loaded within the organization and uh, have something like a ransomware attack created. So those are the top 10 threats organization will face in the future. The measures to counter these attacks uh, include using sec uh, secure web services. Um, we all do most of our surfing to the browser and these browsers can be affected by poison attack, which is a malware in your cache itself. Uh, then there can be SQL injection. There can be manipulated attack. So we need to make sure that there is some form of security to look at these kind of attacks. Uh, and then there are click, uh, uh, you know, uh, hijacking where within a page, there will be some form of link, which will be, which will seem as part of the page in your banking, let's say application, you might end up clicking it and end up going to transaction on adversary site. So you need tool in, in your ecosystem to ensure that the web security is taken into consideration. Uh, there is a body called OWSP, which comes up with OWSP top 10 every year, uh, which gives you indication of the top 10 threats on the web security and application security every year, uh, which comprises of broken authentication, SSL inspection, uh, manual military attack, SQL injections, et cetera. And those are vital to have. There are products which also provide those services. The second measure is to ensure secure development of web servers, services to ensure that uh, the security is embedded in, as a design. Um, another way of doing this uh, measure is secure provisioning of email services. That means we have anti-spam put in place. We have the anti-phishing solution put in place. We put user awareness training. The biggest link and the most vulnerable link is people. people accept those email and as, as many tools you will put in place, they will still uh, be ineffective if the person who is using the emails is not uh, aware and is trained on do's and don'ts there. So the training and awareness is very important. And the fourth thing is global intelligence network. Uh, a zero day attack uh, originates uh, on that particular day. However, there is a huge difference between a time zone, let's say in Africa and Japan. Uh, and if an or, or attack originates in Japan and there is an intelligence network which can indicate that zero day attack has originated before Africa uh, or Asia or US or Europe wakes, uh, then what happens is the threat intelligence can enable 
the tool looking for emails to look for that particular uh, vulnerability or, or update the signatures as well. The fourth is about secure remote access to local network. Uh, originally, we had VPNs, which were formed for point-to-point -point communication. Um, and over time, and especially with after COVID, uh, people started accessing the network, not just uh, for VPN, uh, but also ac accessing the application, accessing the data. So that meant that once you reach from a point A, which is the user, to the organization. Within the organization, you can start doing lateral movement. Now the lateral movement means that you will be having things other than what you're expected to be accessing accessible to you. Now in a scenario where this, this user who is coming to your organization is not the person he's supposed to be. He is somebody else who's taken over the identity of this person and is now accessing. That means he has access to everything in the organization. So there's so we have to have two things. One is we need to make sure that the role-based access is provisioned, discretionary-based access uh, is provisioned, and privilege principle of least privilege is provision. The second thing is now that this session is high, is established, this session between this remote user and the organization also has to be secured. The so you have to have tunneling and encryption, and then you also have to make to make sure that the traffic which is flowing within the encryption is also uh, inspected by SSL inspection. So secure remote access makes sure that does uh, these activity. Another thing which it, which is, which it also helps is to make sure that there is no inbound uh, connection. That means nobody is able to come within the network. They, every user has an identity based on that the role-based access is defined and an outbound connection is established by agent to only provide the information his role defines him to have. Then the fifth solution is uh, secure internet connection to local networks. So we ensure that the right uh, firewalls and right IPS and IDS tools are uh, put in place. Secure PC clients are put in place, antivirus, uh, end user firewalls uh, uh, are put in place. Securing of servers, host-based intrusion prevention system along with EDR and antivirus solutions are put in place. Secure internet telephony, MDM, and other devices are put in devices. And secure wireless connections, you should use BAP2 compliant wireless connection uh, and use right passwords and pins to have access. Uh, and secure email connections to make sure that the, the connectivity uh, or the, uh, for any emails that comes in uh, is, is secure. So those are the security measures we can take uh, for securing uh, any any security uh, vulnerability, possible vulnerability. The emerging security technologies as per Gartner for next eight years uh, are as follows. Uh, in next one year, we will have uh, cloud workload protection platforms uh, being very highly used by organization. Uh, and uh, this, has, this has to do with the adoption of cloud and container, uh, et cetera. Uh, we will have cloud security posture management, which is uh, once you are going into cloud, you might want to see the security of the cloud itself, right? Uh, and uh, there is a standard service provider by cloud provider, and then you have your own baseline security. So you need to make sure that the gap between the baseline security an organization has and the cloud uh, security is assessed. And there is a body called National Institute of Standards, which has laid down uh, the gap analysis process as well. OT security is on the rise, which is operational technologies. Um, most manufacturing, pharmaceutical companies, energy, oil and gas companies, and even telecom companies are moving in this direction to make sure that their plants are secured. Uh, they follow a model called Purdue model where you divide OT into five layers, which includes the network layer, uh, sorry, which, which includes the enterprise layer, the network layer, the server layer, uh, and the layer which takes care of the DCS, PNC, and SCADA, and the walls uh, and actuator layer. Uh, and security of this layer is, is become very, very important. And in next one to three years, we are seeing secure access services, SASE, uh, getting used, SASE is basically uh, the answer to what changes COVID has brought. Uh, 
the traditional access or the network was uh, based on a DMZ model where you have a firewall, IPS, IDS, uh, an endpoint. All this was based because you thought that the user will be sitting behind this, but user is not sitting behind this. The user is now sitting at his home outside of the network. Now you have to give all these solutions, which is a firewall, IDS, IPS, load balancer, and other form of solutions to the user to where he is. That means it is his home or uh, while he is mobile or traveling. So SIC has uh, uh, concepts of SD-WAN, Zero Trust, ZTNA network. It uh, looks at CASB Cloud Assurance Security Broker, uh, and then it looks at uh, role-based access uh, to be provided uh, to the user. Cyber physical security becomes important thing. This is a layer between OT and, uh, and the IT, uh, which is a cyber physical layer. Uh, this is something which we see in one to three years and as per Gartner. Homophobic encryption becomes important. More cryptography will come into place uh, with more key management and certificate management as we move into the cloud. Um, and then we have integrated risk management, which is predicted to be more in use for one to three years. In next three to six years, we see DRM, Digital Risk Protection Service, uh, description, uh, metadata analytics, uh, and moving target defense uh, and decentralized identity. We already have non-human identities, which is robotics and bots uh, whose identity are also access. And then the next six to eight years, uh, as per Gartner, digital ethics, which is very, very important today also, will be very, very uh, highly enforced. Uh, these are some of the trends in terms of spending. Uh, last year, uh, there was a major spending on security services, uh, followed an increase in service spend, followed by the hardware, uh, security hardware spend, and followed by the software spend um, as, per GART, uh, oh, sorry, as per IDC. And these are the various industries which, uh, which will be spending. So healthcare industry, the large enterprise are supposed to have a lot of increase in their spend, uh, where a small and medium-sized business will have uh, some form of spend. Overall, the healthcare and business system, understandably so, will have the highest amount of spend on security. Banking and financial services is another sector which is going to have a lot of spend. They are already spending because more of their customers have gone digital. Uh, banking is now more digital uh, and uh, in further being enforced by the uh, pandemic. And there is a small increase in smaller banks. Telecom, media, and telecommunication uh, further sees an increase in the spend for cybersecurity. Public sector and social sector will again see a lot of uh, increase in the spend. We're already seeing that. Insurance companies see a small increase followed by consumer and retail. Uh, Global transport and global energy uh, has uh, is the most impacted. So they 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 there. We don't see a lot of spend. Advanced industries, there is no change in their expenditure. Uh, so is in professional services. Uh, top security initiatives uh, uh, include awareness and training. Now that we have pandemic, user are at home. Um, the best uh, remediation uh, actor is the user itself. And they're more prone because they're not having the sophisticated uh, security which they had in office. And they neither have all those controls and tools at their home. In fact, their bandwidth is also their personal home internet, which can be uh, not very high speed connectivity. So it is very important that the, the users are trained made aware about the security, what they should be doing, what should be looking for, et cetera. Second is monitoring uh, security operation center. Now that the, the organization is distributed, the application can be on Microsoft, uh, AWS, or in Azure, or in Google, or in the data center. The users are at, either at home, some in office, some possibly traveling. Uh, and if you're a manufacturing company, also the, the, uh, the plants and site, monitoring becomes very important. Now you have more things to monitor uh, in terms of the SOC, 
and then respond to and more scenarios to look for because now you don't have to just look for security incident uh, which which is typically an attack or uh, out of cia is confidentiality integrity and availability but it can be somebody doing crypto mining in your uh, environment and using your environment for the good it might not be basically an attack but it's still uh, you know uh, uh, an incident and similarly somebody taking confidential information we have to redesign a strategy uh, most companies are looking at redesigning the strategies they know that they have to re uh, rearchitect their uh, security posture and reprioritize uh, uh, their spending and their budgets now that their biggest asset uh, outside their data is 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 the employee who is accessing the data sitting outside they have to re-strategize how this whole design and investment on tool people and process has to be made governance again is a big initiative uh, we in europe have gdpr in south africa we have poppy um, so uh, from the data privacy perspective so we need to make sure that the pii data and the data uh, is secured at the same time shadow it and shadow data is looked after roles reporting structures and directives have to be uh, re uh, oriented in light of now the new normal operationalization of security um, the whole incident management process has to be laid down for various scenarios what happens if you find a ransomware attack which has severe impact on the organization it's a high risk it can shut down and cripple the whole organization what is the incident management process for that as again a false positive or as against a user uh, availability issue so those prioritization has to be done in operations and those those processes have to be laid down all scenarios have to be laid down uh, control scenarios have to be laid down and they are getting laid down as per the directive by bodies like nist risk assessment becomes very important regularly doing vulnerability scan uh, and the threats organization have is very important defining uh, the remediation strategy for vulnerabilities tracking those vulnerabilities are also a very important aspect in terms of uh, risk management uh, also identification of gaps uh, by doing penetration testing uh, by doing risk assessment to find out where are the gaps where are the vulnerabilities uh, a possible answer for that is a pen tester who can do penetration testing and find out the vulnerabilities and gaps the organization have and hence define the risk and then using the right uh, tools to ensure the risk scoring on which score which risk is of high risk which is moderate risk and which is low risk so that one uh, an organization can prioritize the risk uh, based on the assessment accordingly metrics to prepare and report the effectiveness now uh, now that we have so many gaps which will be identified now we have to prioritize and define people process and system uh, form of risk and then we we need to make sure that the measures are defined on what has to be done uh, in terms of an action once a risk has been uh, identified and then uh, review it so some organization use nist framework some use i uh, sans 20 framework to see the gap assessment and uh, how they score in various areas within the risk Uh, of the organization regulatory and leg- legislative compliance uh, there are legal compliance legal requirements in terms of access to the hardware software data uh, of the organization uh, customer data uh, having uh, uh, visibility of that etc um, and depending on industry for example if you are a healthcare company you will be compliant required to be compliant to hipaa if you are or equivalent on that that particular country which is for health and uh, 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 health industry similarly energy uh, uh, industry uh, uh, has to have no car or relatively compliant as per the region uh, so there are regulations which are geographical uh, of nature and business uh, nature those have to be compliant and identity and access now that we have identity as a new parameter uh your your access to the organization can be from your company's own laptop uh, or from your mobile or from your own laptop uh what you have is a uh, password user id single sign on multi factor authentication to authenticate you to who you are uh 
Uh, so the new boundary or the perimeter is identity. And it's very, very crucial that we define identity. We provide role-based access, discretionary-based access, need-based access, task-based access, uh, mandatory-based access. Uh, and then it is, it is linked to the Federation service. Similarly, we have privilege access management for the admins for uh, ensuring that uh, the passwords are protected uh, principle of least privilege is put in picture. At the same time, sessions are recorded uh, as well as uh, we have analytics uh, in, in terms of any risk to the organization. So those are the top cybersecurity initiatives organization have. And um, I will now go to the next chapter on the cybersecurity area. Um, before I go further, are there any questions? So we can type questions in the chat box and uh, Dr. Vail will, will be happy to respond if you have any questions. Yeah, how are we planned for breaks? I think we are right now in one hour from the session has started. Yes. Uh, when do we want to take breaks? Because this is a new chapter in terms of what are the cybersecurity services. Um, you want to me to continue this chapter? Or you want to take a short break? So, so let's uh, let's ask the audience. Would you like a five-minute break? Uh, because this is not the big major break. Would you like a five-minute break, or shall we continue? You can give us some reactions or type in the chat. What do you think? Just let us know if you'd like. Please continue. Pranit says yes. Right, right. Fair enough. <laughs> Anyone else? Do you think, uh, would you like a five minute break? I, I feel like we're into it, you know, so it might even break the flow. Um, Fair enough. Any other? So I'll, I'll continue. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thanks Praneet and um, Uche Brown for your interest. Um, uh, thank you so much. It's very encouraging. And please do ask any question uh, if you have, I'll move ahead. So the areas of cybersecurity includes um, application security. Uh, application security is uh, a, a complete uh, syllabus in itself uh, and a world in itself uh, where we are looking at agile, uh, DevSecOps, CI CD pipeline, containers. And then we are looking at codes, uh, a developer uh, developing a code and that code which he's developing uh, has to be secured. Uh, and then multiple developers are writing the same uh, same binary. And when these binary uh, codes come together, again, getting tested. And then uh, we are looking at the environment in which this code is written. Uh, and then we are looking at uh, the, the compilers itself getting secured uh, as such. And then we are looking at uh, the, the user uh, or, or the, uh, the identity of the user himself. Um, Traditionally, this was done at the end of our development cycle, where once a development team finishes a sprint, the or various sprints and develops a binary or a source code, then uh, testing took place. Uh, what used to happen then is uh, if the code was found to be defective, then you go all the way back and start the work again. So if it's taken four weeks or four months, you go back and start the process. So it was costly uh, for the organization and time consuming. So we had uh, uh, the agile methodology uh, and then now the DevSecOps where you shifted left. What you do is right at the build stage, uh, we define uh, the parameters uh, which will be looked at in terms of who does what, uh, what has to be looked at in terms of deviation, compliance requirement, etc. Uh, and then when the development happens and the code comes in in forms of bots, those bots are further scanned. Uh, for uh, malicious bot as against legitimate bots. And then at that stage also, we do something called SAS, uh, statistical uh, application security testing to see real-time vulnerabilities as the code is written. And uh, at the same time, do something uh, uh, called RASP, runtime application security protection, which is on a real-time, you know, testing the codes uh, while it is getting developed. Uh, at this stage, and uh, we also do fuzzing, uh, fuzzing is where you are also at the same time trying to see what an adversary would have done if he would have attacked you uh, in, in a very stimulated environment. 
and uh, find out uh, the the uh, the resilience of the code and the and the vulnerability in the code. Once you move from the uh, the, the development cycle to the testing cycle, then you conduct uh, a full blown SAS statistical application security testing and dynamic application security testing. Dynamic application security testing now looks at the whole whole environment as such and looks at vulnerability uh, in the whole uh, pipeline as such. Then uh, you have something called IS, iterative application security testing, which looks at various aspects uh, of uh, the code. Uh, and you also introduce RASP once more for time application security testing. Um, and once you have done this, this element of security testing and you have found uh, or vulnerabilities, you do the patching uh, or you do the uh, uh, correct action. And if the codes are uh, good enough to the next stage, uh, to the deployment stage, uh, then you again uh, have the vulnerability assessment, penetration testing taken care of uh, to look at the environment uh, as well. Now at this stage, if you're looking at container, then the container security also comes in to look uh, scan the codes. Now, depending on uh, if you are using container at the deploy stage uh, or you're looking, having the containers used throughout the CI CD pipeline, uh, the container scans will happen to see that when the code moves from one stage to the other, there is no vulnerability. And now that the code is ready and you have to uh, upload to an FTP server, then you look at the session, uh, you look at the malware attack, you look at the FTP server for any vulnerability. And all of this is further getting monitored uh, through the security operating team uh, to look at any deviation which is done, uh, which is linked to something called threat modeling, which looks at the uh, compliance uh, process, as well as the the process which have uh, you know laid down in terms of where a code development cycle will move from. Any deviation is an incident where the incident management team comes in and intervenes. So this is application security. The advanced persistent threat, on the other hand, is uh, the um, you know zero day attack, uh, targeted attack, advanced uh, attacks uh, there. And uh, for this, we use tools such as EDR, uh, endpoint detection response, and uh, uh, the managed detection and response to look for either signature based, either behavior based, or AI based uh, anomalies uh, in these uh, malware. And depending on if it's a signature base, you update those tools. They are typically linked to the SOC, the automated SOC as well, which is Security Operating Center. Um, the advanced persistent threat is now moved to the next level from endpoint protection to network protection. So you now have advanced persistent threat look more both in network and in endpoint and further integrated in the security operation center for any advanced threat. Then we have the cryptography. All the data we have uh, is either at rest, either in motion, or is it used? Uh, in all these three forms, we have to protect this data. Um, and uh, we have now a third, second layer. Apart from protection, we have to comply to regulatory reasons. For example, GDPR, which is the Data Privacy Act in the European Union, talks about uh, no unauthorized person should be able to access or see the data of a customer or of employee, which he should not be able to see. Second is the right to be protection, right to be forgotten. That means if I have chosen this right, you should not have my data. However, if I do not have your data and somebody from my sales or business development or some other organization reaches out to you, I have a legal suit to me. So I have to mask the data. Mask the data for this compliance region for right to be forgotten. At the same time, the right person only be able to see so because I will have the data in my database system, which will be accessible to everybody uh, based on their role. Uh, but the glandular uh, form of access in terms of uh, data, uh, because if they are able to access the data, what they have to, they can still see the other data. And that seeing the data is a legal issue. And it's also have a confidentiality issue. So we mask the data. Uh, and we encrypt the data so that A, it is masked for insider. Uh, not to be able to see when he is doing the transaction, let's say salary of a person uh, or a health record of a person or HR record of a person or whatever uh, might be the form of data. And then the data is getting uh, transacted, encrypting the data in the transaction. 
there are new concept on cloud because in cloud this data is now in a third party so you do splicing of the data so the data is not uh, you know in one place it's applied only an algorithm can bring it together so and there are various techniques uh, uh cryptography uh, cipher uh, and masking obfuscation salting that is used in this particular uh, this thing area and um, uh in order to do that we do classification of data discovery of data because now the data apart from the it is also originating from ot so it is unstructured uh, structured so data has to be classified as secret confidential top secret internal uh and uh, also as data which is public in nature and you have to provide security controls accordingly and you also make a choice on whether this data depending on it is top secret would there should be in public cloud it should be retained whether it should be in or in private cloud so those decision are also driven by this particular area then cyber security services include the monitoring of security uh, it includes uh, uh any patch updates uh, or any any form of intervention or incident response which has to be done risk management and assurance looks at various risk in terms of third party in terms of business in terms of it controls in terms of gaps and based on those risk uh, you know we provide uh, uh you know vulnerability management service uh, risk remediation service uh, risk um, uh, scoring service and then corrective actions to remediate or overcome those risk cloud based security is is the most uh, uh, recent phenomena and and the one which is uh, of uh, very high importance today to company as they are making their programs to go towards the cloud um now cloud is is typically having two elements which is cloud native security which is provided by cloud service provider uh as well as the uh, security services which the uh, company which takes the cloud services has to brought and hence uh, the service provider like hcl my company or somebody else they might choose to integrate with uh typically uh, the base solution includes the ddos uh, kind of services some form of uh, firewalls uh, pim services uh, and if it is azure uh or either microsofts and some form of azure related services which are provided uh, on top of it you are expected to manage uh, the keys uh, if you are multi cloud they, they also provide key management solution uh, but uh, encryption as such uh, uh, advanced firewalls as such sniffing tools as such identity governance etc and uh, are something which you expect the service provider to provide or the customer who is taking the services from the cloud services provider like aws azure or google to have uh, also um, then um, uh, the monitoring part um, management of servers security of the servers or or the virtual machines uh, are also the responsibility of the system integrator uh, to take care uh, take care of there uh, and of course into your is Govern risk and compliance. Uh, the various IT compliance, like the ones Poppy in South Africa, or GDPR in Europe, uh, or something which have to be looked at HIPAA, NERC, and other industry compliance or compliance. Those are something which which have to be assessed, uh, which have to be then adhered to with the gaps, and uh, uh, we uh, or or the the companies have to be supported in meeting those uh, govern risk and compliance area. uh this also includes third party risk the organizations might have uh identifying those risk and uh giving a view to the companies in order to mitigate them enterprise security management uh, includes uh, management of firewalls antivirus edr ips ids firewall assurance services etc and uh, on top of it providing the soc services for monitoring uh incident response incident remediation and forensic services there so that's uh, an overview on what are the areas in which cyber security services can be offered the 10 steps in terms of uh, cyber security includes managing privileged users uh there will be users who are admins in your organizations 
who have privilege access there will be senior management who will have privilege access now uh, these uh, admins uh, these super users uh, will have access to confidential data they might have the privileges to make changes to crucial organization um, passwords access etc so they become in themselves very important and a risk center so we need to make sure that we we bring in uh, solutions where um, the passwords are generated for every session that is created the sessions are recorded uh, and analytics are done um, on top of that and the principle of least privilege is uh, is put into place so that if a super user or privilege user is compromised the risk to the company is minimal uh, incident management becomes a very very important aspect now you might have four three ways in which you might capture an incident one is the user calls you or user emails you that hey i am having this issue it has to be resolved uh, the second is that the itsm gives you a ticket that there is these issues you need to resolve the fourth is that you third is that you you identified through the tools like siem an incident and you have gotten an alert that this is uh, something which is wrong and you need to do something about it once you have this then you have to identify whether this is actually a security incident or whether it's a fault positive and something to do uh, with the you know user itself or it has to do with some failure of a hardware or software component then you pass it on to the right team to take care of it but if you have identified a security incident then you have to take corrective actions to mitigate it this means uh, if it's a malware then you have to go to the owner of that asset uh, have the access to that asset and then try to uh, find out the kind of malware and remediate it if it is uh, somebody who's uh, done any compliance related issue or uh, is violating any access uh, or any any legal uh, part of the country where you are operating then those have to be recorded and the, the next step in terms of either intimating the cso or chief risk officer uh, and at the same time remediating has to be done and various scenarios of incident response in terms of criticality uh, and the severity has to be defined and the time mean time to respond mttr mean time to remediate mean time to recover Uh, has to be defined and this has to be also has to be part of your uh, bcp dr or business continuity continuity and disaster recovery as well monitoring becomes very important uh, so that uh, the third part of what i said in the previous one which is uh, you observing uh, an incident is 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 captured so uh, depending on the ask of the organization at 24 by 7 8 by 5 which is 8 hours a day 5 days a week or 16 hour days 5 days a week or 7 days a week or 24 hours a day 7 days a week is monitored for various indicator of compromise iocs uh, and for any different use cases these use cases have to be developed on a regular basis uh, and updated on a regular basis this can be right from a malware to any anomaly in user uh which which has to be captured this might be fingerprinting a user uh and um, uh you know which can help you to see that uh, if a user has access to certain areas of the network uh and you fingerprinted that he's, he typically doesn't go to those part networks and suddenly he's attempting to go to those part of network or he's signing in from multiple devices at the same time it is through through two different locations that means it's an incident so you need to have the use cases defined so that it raises alert and you have to monitor for those uh, home and mobile working is becoming crucial uh, people are working from home at their bandwidth of their homes uh, and the security controls secure remote access uh, split tunneling for traffic for the uh, microsoft uh, you know which is typically office 65 emails is routed separately to against traffic for the data center traffic for application and internet so that becomes very crucial crucial it's like your load balancer and then you put all the security controls uh, in terms of ssl inspection in terms of uh, man in the attacking session hijacking etc email uh, spear phishing on to that laptop itself uh, and that uh, home user uh, has to be secured accordingly 
secure configuration, you put the right configuration in place, right policies, up-to-date policies, so that uh, you know, right uh, access is provided, right sites are accessed, right data is accessed, uh, uh, right people are given role-based access, uh, so that compliance doesn't have a problem. There's no shadow IT and shadow data. People accessing data they are not supposed to access. The people uploading data for what they are not supposed to do. All this uh, will be covered by the secure configuration. Removal media control, USB based access where people can take data or uh, interact a uh, system by USB. That has to be looked at. Malware prevention. So things like antivirus, EDR. Uh, have to be put in place uh, so that advanced uh, attacks, uh, antivirus uh, or the viruses are protected from. Uh, and user education awareness is 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 another very very important area. Now that we have covered all this, all this has, the user has to be aware about it. He has he needs to know about them. He needs to know what he has to do and what he doesn't have to be, do, be doing. So user training and awareness in the language of whichever country you're doing is very important. And network security, the firewall, the IDS, the IPS, uh, et cetera, have to be configured right. Now that we are looking at um, the network becoming boundaryless and uh, user working from home and other places, uh, we need to make sure that the policies of remote access uh, is put in place, split tunneling is put in place, uh, proxy setting and cloud proxy settings are put in place accordingly. So those are the top 10, um, security uh, steps and i'll give it a pause uh, again uh, for any questions yes i see somebody hands is up uh, well, I'm uh, please go ahead uh, good morning sir uh, can you hear me Yes, yes. go ahead. Um, okay. Um, uh, in, in your talk, um, good morning. Thank you very much for your time. Um, in your talk, when you use the word container, and I would, I would like if I can get um, like a better explanation on what containers are and um, they are used in terms of application developments. Yeah. So containers are typically virtual machines uh, which are... Uh, you know, having faster boot time, um, easy to install. They are used in the DevSecOps environment, typically in the deployment stage, but now used at various stages of CI CD pipelines. There, uh, uh, they are one step ahead of the virtual machines. That means they, they are they take less processing, uh, faster boot up time there, and save the time for the developers. Uh, uh, but they have low security, uh, which is there in them uh, as such. And uh, today, more, many companies are using containers uh, for their whole CI/CD pipeline. Uh, there are products like Docker's. Uh, that's an example of container that is uh, uh, highly used uh, by in uh, by companies today uh, for security. So this also does segmentation work. So you know uh, you have multiple containers used, multiple uh, application and codes are hosted in multiple containers. Uh, and what happens is that these containers ensure that uh, if there is any vulnerability, that doesn't spread across to other containers and it's just confined from that perspective. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I'll move to the next uh, one then. Uh, these are the, uh, where does the cyber threat comes originates from? We have crackling information warfare, um, you know, com countries and companies uh, spying on each other to have competitive edge, uh, cyber espionage, cyber crime, cyber terror and hackism. Uh, and these are done by uh, the way of spam, uh, by then uh, way of identity theft, where uh, the identity of uh, various stakeholders in companies is stolen, and through those identities, uh, you know, adversaries accesses their and organization systems, and uh, you know, depending on uh, the objective, if it is co compromising of confidentiality in terms of 
getting access to the competition data, in integrity or availability, they uh, they uh, launch the attack. So if they have to get access to the confidential data, then you they will take over the identity and get the access to the uh, confidential data of the organization. If it is availability, they will make sure that uh, they, they, they lead you to DDoS attack or some form of attacks which leads to the availability of functioning of the company. If it is integrity, they will end up changing some confidential data uh, which can lead to uh, the loss for organization. Then we have malicious codes such as virus, bomb, proton, et cetera, which are unleashed in the organization either to cripple or spy again for uh, confidence, compromisation of confidentiality, integrity and availability. Uh, phishing attacks, which are again uh, um, uh, attacks where email carries a malware in form of attachment or in terms of the content of body of the email itself. Denial of service attacks are again attacks where you flood the uh, the organization traffic uh, with uh, with traffic so that uh, the organization is overwhelmed uh, and it uh, it if it effectively shuts down. Uh, packet snoofing is another uh, similar form where you try to snoof the packets and find out information about the packets uh, and uh, lead to uh, compromise of confidentiality itself. And then there are ransomware attack, which make sure that uh, the adversary takes over the control of the systems. Uh, and then uh, in, 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 in lieu of giving access to the companies, ask for ransom uh, from the company. The measures for security for, for protection include uh, access control so that you give only right people the access uh, and none authorized person is not having the access to the system. Communication protection. So you, from a point to point connectivity, you make sure that you have right uh, encryption, you have uh, SSL inspection, you have right firewalls, rules and policies, and then you have the intrusion prevention, intrusion detection uh, layers also put in place. Uh, physical and environment protection, make sure you have the right physical and the environment uh, protection put in place. In terms of system protection, you make sure the all the system, the PCs, laptop servers are protected with the right tools. Uh, you have a continuity plan. Uh, and uh, this is a part of the bus larger business continuity plan where you have various scenarios covered. So what happens if you're DDoS, so you have a you know load balancing, you, you have another route through which the traffic can be routed. And then you also have security consideration. So if you had a firewall in the, uh, let's say an IPLC or a lease line or an ISDN, if you do a load routing, you make sure that similar firewalls and uh, are in place so that uh, you know the purpose of the attacker is not to uh, uh, you know, make you go to the other route because he knows that the other route doesn't have a firewall. So you need to make sure that your business continuity plan has, uh, you know, uh, uh, a backup route, uh, but that backup route has to have all controls in place. Um, incident reporting, any incident that is identified has to be reported uh, and then uh, recorded as well for future learning. And the legal compliance uh, has to be adhered to. We uh, have various tools to look at this as well. And those uh, processes has to be put in place for them. So those are the security measures for protection. I'll give it a pause again for any question and have a sip of water. Yes, sir, you have a question. I'm presuming it's from the last last question. No, this is uh, Pranit. Uh, he's typing so I can read the question in the chat. Yeah. So afternoon, sir. <laughs> My question is, he's typing, how do we protect sensitive information handled and stored by third party vendors? Yeah, that's a very good question, Pranit. Um, so the third party vendors um, will include uh, cloud service provider, 
uh, it will be including your system integrated partner like HCL. Um, it will be including your um, uh, partners in your supply chain who are your suppliers as well. Um, one of course is you, you have to have it as a part of your security policy document and uh, business continuity uh, and disaster recovery plan to start with where you give an outline. Second uh, is that uh, you ensure, and most companies are doing it now, that they have third party identity and experts put in place uh, so that those party have access based on the identity and access management tool and the rules you put in that, that is uh, discretionary based access, role based access, uh, and uh, a mandatory based access which you define for them. The second, third thing which you do in which, which one of our customer did want it. Uh, let's say if you are uh, 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 an organization which, uh, which is into commodity trading, uh, for example, a commodity or your bank in commodity and so you, are, you have a B2B uh, profile of uh, customers who are going to access uh, you know, that particular platform for commodity and commodity trading. And it's in the same time, there will be other customers also whose data will be there. So we do data masking on that. So that uh, even if you, once you have established the role-based access uh, and now the right person is only access to, able to access that particular data for which they are supposed to be looking at, they are not able to see the data of the other parties. So that's this th second thing. Third thing is you put a layer of encryption on top of it. Uh, so that you ensure that uh, even if somebody attempts to have uh, access to that, uh, it is encrypted there. Um, when it comes to cloud, uh, therefore there are splicing solutions further done where they splice the data and spread the data into multiple areas within the cloud so they don't reside in one area. Uh, and then you have to have an algorithm to put it together there. Uh, so organization uh, use uh, various form of uh, uh, techniques. One of those uh, techniques is cipher um, based uh, uh, where the data is crumbled or synthetic data is put in place. So the data you're looking at is actually not the real data. Um, so essentially it is a combination of identity access management, role-based access. Uh, as well as uh, cryptography uh, in terms of data masking and data encryption. That's the two main uh, things uh, one needs to do. There are various techniques which are used by organization uh, in doing it, uh, you know, depending on the key, uh, SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-3, SHA-5, SHA-4, or MDI, what, what standards you want to use. Those can also be further defined. And identity access management, again, works on based on what you have. For example, if you have it hosted, uh, the data is hosted on uh, Microsoft. So Microsoft has their own, uh, you know, uh, preference of uh, IGA partners, which they have listed. Then you provide solution based on those partners in order to provide identity governance and identity access for those companies. So I hope that answers uh, you, Praneet. We have a couple more questions. What well, Praneet, um, has that been answered? If you could just indicate. Yes, thank you. All right, so Uche asks, aside from installing an antivirus on a PC, is there any other thing one needs to do to prevent attacks? And then we have another question. Yeah, so antivirus, uh, uh, you know, have been very, very effective for decades now, but, uh, over the years, uh, what has happened is that there are uh, zero day attacks, uh, there are spear phishing attacks, there are anti spams and web, web attacks which are happening. Uh, so what has happened is that uh, while antivirus is going to look for uh, any malware that is coming into you, to your system, uh, it might not be able to attack the zero day attacks uh, or advanced attack. So for that, uh, you have solutions like EDR, a, uh, endpoint detection response tools or uh, XDR for looking at those kinds of attack, targeted attacks. Then email becomes very important uh, because uh, if you have an email that is coming to you, uh, the two ways uh, you know you can have infringement 
One is people start sending you spam mails, which you don't want. Uh, the second is they spend fear phishing mail, which has malware in the mail itself. So you need to scan those mails. So you need to make sure you have the right email security tool uh, to do that. And similarly, a browser through which you do the browsing can itself have a cache in it uh, or a poison attack in the cache, which poison is, is an attack where they, they infiltrate the, the browser itself. And every time you browse, you're actually, uh, you know, going to the adversary site or, uh, you know, uh, infected site um, or the session can be hijacked. So uh, there are virus comp antivirus companies which have packaged tools. You can look at those tools, uh, but you definitely need more than antivirus. Today. Okay, okay, please confirm if your question has been answered in the chat, please. We uh, please keep the questions coming because uh, yes. Uh, so Olami Lecon says, is it possible to have multiple layer privileged user access control that requires multiple privileged users authentication before data can be accessed, as I believe this can prevent negligent insiders attacks or attack. Yeah. Yeah. So there are two things which are done. One is identity and access. So now most of the identity and access uh, uh, solutions uh, have uh, identity analytics built into it. So what happens is that there is a solution where UEBA, User and Enterprise Behavior Analytics. Uh, UEBA, what it does is that uh, it, it for three months, you put the record of all the employees in that, and it fingerprints all the user in terms of their behavior, how they typically behave. And then it, it starts looking at anomaly. What companies further do is they put threat intel into it. Now threat intels are from various sources. Uh, one of the source of threat intel is deep dark web. Uh, deep dark web is where they look at your social engineering life, somebody you are contacted, uh, somebody you are in contact with, and that person can convince, compromise somebody who has fixed account that has got created. All that intelligence is gathered and fused into it. So now if that intelligence data has found out that the person uh, ABC has uh, his friends uh, data compromise and his passwords are already compromised, then there is a red alert on that user. So the analytics will further, you know, decrease his, his privileges. That's number one. Number two, if you are an admin who is apart from getting access to data, can change the data, can change the passwords, can change the configuration. So what happens is they use something called privilege access management. What it does is every time the admin tries to access, it will generate the pass password at that time only. And for every access, a new password is generated. So that even if an adversary uh, has taken over the identity, he still needs to go to the privilege access management to conduct his role of a uh, privilege user. Uh, so there, one, he is authenticated. Second is uh, for a malicious insider, the session is getting recorded also. So if he's making any wrong changes, session is recorded. So there is a fingerprint left which is getting recorded, which can be audited uh, further. And then it, this one also has the analytics. So once you have the identity access management, which does role-based access, discretionary based access, privilege access, on top of identity and access management, you have UEBA, user and enterprise behavior analytics. And the user and behavior analytics, enterprise behavior analytics has that intelligence feed into it, which further enriches identity access management, uh, adaptive uh, analytic capability. And as far as privileged user is concerned, who are admin or super users or VIP users, for them, privilege access management is there. That means every time they want to do have the access of privilege access, which they, they, they should, they will be having a new password generated for them. And their session is recorded and the analytics is done and principle of least privileges further enforced on them. So these are the two ways in which multi-factor uh, authentication time or multi layer of uh, identity access is done for users. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, Olami Lekon, please confirm if your question has been answered. Uh, next question, while we go through the next question, uh, is from Hamad, and he says, is all data secure and backed up on a routine basis? So I guess he means, should all data be secure and backed up? Uh, and if it is backed up, where will it be kept and uh, be protected? 
so uh, what happens is that you do first thing is data discovery uh, and find out the structured unstructured data uh, from the it and iot and ot then you do data classification in terms of uh, top secret secret confidential inside uh, or internal or and public so you will want to make sure that the top secret and secret data resides within the organization you might want confidential data can be possibly on private cloud public data uh, or inside data can be on private cloud uh, and similarly the backup for those will be also accordingly uh, uh, and uh, you know the uh, dr will be accordingly that means that public data can be having uh, multiple site hosting by microsoft uh, and uh, similarly you can have it on a uh, multi cloud environment as well the data which you have either in private cloud then you will want it to be backed on another private cloud or on your own data center and similarly something in your data center is there you might want it to be on a multi site environment based on your bcp dr plan uh, which you have in place and the uh, you know uh, business continuity uh, process you would have put in place does that answer your question Okay, so Hamid has confirmed as well as Olami Lekong and uh, Sanjay, just in terms of timing, just to let you know that we're about uh, 35 minutes to the major break. All right, fair enough. Uh, so I'll move ahead uh, to the next slide. So this is important. I thought I'll share this with you. A lot of companies, you know, security is a negative goal. Um, and, uh, you know, you don't earn money by securing, but then you have to constantly go and ask for investment because uh, if you don't protect the organization, uh, you know, the organization might have losses out of uh, the downtime they have, the reputation losses. Some companies have, loss of life also depending on the industry industry like energy oil and gas especially can lead to and 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 in case of mining as well can leads to loss of life also due to security safety become very paramount anywhere in manufacturing um, and uh, sometimes uh, you know the timing is important and irreversible damage can be done but still uh, you have to figure out what is the return of security investment. So the return of security investment is calculated by annual loss of expectancy uh, into the mitigation ratio minus the cost of the solution. Uh, let's say I end up telling you you should bring uh, next generation firewall, so there will be a cost, uh, divided by the cost of solution. The figure will give you the return on security investment. This is a common thing which is discussed uh, on how do you quantify the money you've been asking to invest in security. Uh, so this is some answer. There are more formulas to it, but this is fundamental uh, in terms of uh, giving the justification of investment for security. The five barriers in addressing security challenges, uh, lack of sufficient budget. Uh, as I said, this is an ongoing battle, uh, an ongoing uh, advancement. And this has further got completely disrupted since COVID because the line between what is a network uh, and what is uh, security has got blurred. Uh, and the concept of SASIs has made it blurred. Uh, in your company, when you go to work, you have a local area network, wider area network, metropolitan area network. Now that you're working from home, that LAN, WAN, and MAN is your internet of home. Your personal internet has become everything there. So now all that security has to be put in there. So this is the new parameter. And the way of looking at funding has changed uh, from where we, we were looking at it. Other thing is inadequate availability or cybersecurity professional. There is a huge gap between the number of uh, cybersecurity professional required as again, the cybersecurity professional available. There is also a big gap of what has happened post COVID. A lot of things which were uh, happening 
a year and a half because before within the span of one of half year become ancient so updated skills of security professional has become very very important also there are other dynamics because with uh, work from home the security professionals are meant to be working remotely and that brings a new challenge lack of documented process is another challenge uh, you know uh, the incident response process how do you prioritize uh, security uh, how do you have the security policy determined uh, how do you define the awareness uh, and uh, how do you define the uh, acceptance of usability if you have all the tools i told you about an application put in place and the application developer doesn't use the tool because he thinks it slows him down uh, then it is of no use so you, you need to have a well documented process and well recorded uh, process as well and you have to have visibility and that brings to the point of visibility the lack of visibility and influence within the enterprise now uh, big organization you know have big power centers etc etc uh, so what security uh, things is right has to be bought by everybody it has to be bought by the application team it has to be bought by the infra team it has to be bought by business cio team and the ceo team uh, and then the security has to have the visibility because if you put all security controls in the in the infrastructure you have firewall ips ids and the application is completely empty and you have don't have visibility then you have a possibility back door for the adversary to enter similarly if you have all these in it and application and you have nothing in the ot which also has an uh, you know historian server human machine interface it has a scada server it has a firewall it has all the control it has a connectivity because your supply chain uh, servers are lying there so that integration is also there so that the attack can come from that side also and vice versa so there has to be a holistic view uh, for the companies and it can't be lying in silos it can't work in silos so consensus creation is a very important aspect as far as uh, security is concerned and those are also the barriers so these are the checklist in terms of what we should have we have should have a trustworthy it vendor both uh, the uh, uh, system integrator or uh, and the product companies which they using a lot of malwares have been found in products which are called untrusted software uh, which are been lying and spying lying in the company's environment and spying on them um, uh, or have some trojan horse in them so we have to be very careful what we bring into the state uh security software up to date we need to make sure that the patches the versions uh and if it is end of life it has to be changed so a if there is an update it has to be updated as a version it has to be updated uh and if a product you are using is got end to life it is very highly advisable that it has to be changed regular pen testing has to be done uh to ensure that you find out the gaps and the vulnerabilities which uh, is in the network before and adversaries find it out and uh, you know uh, hack into your network um, and at the same time you to make sure that uh, you make you have the right uh, uh, data protection because even if uh, you hire somebody to do pen testing and he is able to see the gap once he sees the gap he is also going to see your data and you will have a legal issue so you need to make sure that uh, before you give it to it uh, some you know a red team or a pen testing team to do it you have that particular department if you are a healthcare company if a patient records those are those are must uh, before uh, you do it so both have to be done correctly uh, backup to the cloud and hard disk has to be done so you need to have complete uh, backup and uh, disaster recovery plan and process in place periodical change in the wifi password it has to be web compliant security policies need to be up to date uh, if you have a policy which was post pre covid which says what people will do come when they come to office if nobody is coming to office that policy has to be planned as per what they would doing be doing what when they are at home and they have to be given directive and instructions accordingly uh, enforce use of strong passwords uh, and of course needless to say Uh, keeping it secret not sharing the password uh, and uh, at the same time not putting in chats etc uh, and of course protection uh, from uh, you know uh, having it hanging it on your pc etc so 
uh, or, or of course the IT has to make sure that it's a brute force attack protection as well. And then we have two-factor authentication. That means uh, apart from password, there is uh, uh, you know, a pin which comes on your phone uh, or some form of other multi-factor authentication put in place or biometric place put in place to ensure that uh, there is further security put in place. So those are the checklist in security is concerned. From a security maturity process, where you are, uh, you know, at various stages, there is an ad hoc stage where things are very informal. Hey, we have one security person. He does application also. He does network also. He does, uh, you know, OT as well. He does this thing, um, and you know, that's how we manage. So that's that's where you have this ad hoc basis that if, we, if the need arises, it'll come. It's reactive. It's inconsistent performance. And then there is a developing one. You move from the ad hoc to developing one, which is, which is a likely repeatability, some consistency, uh, lack uh, rigorous process and discipline. And then there is a practicing one where you have defined control, documented standards, and consistent performance. And then you have the optimizing stage where you have effective control, user process metrics, and target improvement, you know what you need to achieve. You are on SOC 1.0 and you need to go to SOC 4.0 5.0 and bring in automation, UEBA and uh, analytics. So you have a clear path laid in, in picture for it. Leading it, there is an integrated strategy, as I mentioned, for example, BCP, business continuity cannot be in isolation. If you have to fulfill an order as a manufacturing company and the site goes down, because of security, you have to have it in a plan. If you can't invoice to the customer and earn money, it will be hitting your cash flow. So that again has to be security led. So you have to have a plan which is integrated. Innovation, innovative changes have to be put in place. That means if tomorrow you're going to use connected device and big data, then you have to have innovation put in place. And seamless controls have to be put in place so that they work in, in harmony there. So those that is a particular, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, the maturity curve for organization security. Uh, in terms of traditional versus uh, new operations, traditionally companies had logs, events, uh, and uh, alerts. And um, but now there are much more to look for. You know, we just discussed. Somebody asked about antivirus. We have email. You have social activity. People are using looking at Facebook, LinkedIn, they're clicking content, their pictures which can be connected, which can be infected. There can be you know, content which might have malware. You just read the content, open the content and you're unleashing the malware. Uh, the web page text can be uh, you know, having uh, uh, basically click uh, hijacking or uh, session hijacking in that itself or malware or external threat intelligence feed, full packet and DNS capture business process data, customer transactions can be unsafe, um, identity can be compromised there. Configuration information uh, you know, can also be an issue. The system audit trails that you needed, network flow and anomalies can have to be looked at. So there, and there are much more uh, uh, beyond these as well on the cloud uh, on application side. So as against what we were looking for, uh, the, the, the underlying estate has uh, has uh, evolved uh, to a much larger area. So we need a roadmap. Uh, this roadmap needs to include access where we do record all the assets which we have. We conduct, conduct risk assessment for those assets. Then we do build where we create infosec policy. That policy has to be comprehensive and has to be circulated to all the employees uh, and they are need to make uh, need to be made aware about that policy, uh, and we need to create policy information of assets, uh, and then we have to choose which where we do establish controls to enforce policies, identify technologies to plug in gaps uh, as well. So if you're using NIST uh, RMF framework, which is protect, detect, respond, and remediate, uh, and Within that protect, detect, respond, and remediate, there are subcategories. And those subcategories need tools in order to plug in those gaps. Then you have a roadmap to plug in those gaps. Once you have a roadmap prepared uh, and you do rating of uh, where you are, let's say one to five, you are in three, and you start uh, working toward deployment and do the reassessment. 
So you deploy, test the defined controls, implement the, those controls, and they after three months, six months, or year, whatever uh, the policy which you have prepared, where you will do the assessment, you do the assessment on where the gaps are and where how you're rated from where you were originally. And then you educate people, make awareness for the employees, partners for third party risk, which might be the system integrated partner like HCL, or it might be the uh, you know, value chain partner, your supplier, uh, and then establish a process for reporting non-compliance uh, and track the actions on those non-compliance. And retest, establish defense periodically, uh, conduct system audits aligned with emerging threats. So that's a roadmap. Uh, which we have, the 10 compartments of security ethics. Uh, so ethics becomes very important uh, to be a good global citizen and to be a good uh, corporate citizen. You shall not use a computer to harm other people. Some countries is illegal um, and they have uh, laws for them. Uh, you shall not interfere with other people computer work, which is again, uh, legal in many countries. You should not snoop around in other people's computer files, which is completely no, no. You should not use a computer to steal. You should not use computer to bear false witness. You should not copy or use proprietary software for which you're not paid without permission. You should not use other people's computer resource without authorization or proper compensation. You should not appropriate other people's intellectual output. And you should not think about the social consequences of the program you are writing or the system you're designing. And you should always use a computer in the ways that ensure consideration and respect for all fellow humans. Uh, and I'm sure all of us follow those, but I thought it was important to highlight this uh, cyber ethics. Uh, just to recapture what all is included in cybersecurity. So you have infra security, which includes endpoint, firewall, IDS, IPS, et cetera. Cloud security, which has class B, CWLP, uh, key management, data security, classification, DLP, encryption, masking. Application security, which includes DAS, SAS, VAPT, fuzzing, RASP. Govern risk and compliance, which includes IT governance, industry compliance, OT compliance. OT security, which includes SCADA, uh, HMI security, PLC, DCS security, uh, which is distributed control system and discovery. Uh, and all of this has to be managed through a security operating center, a SOC with the modern same uh, UABA SOAR intelligence uh, plugged in with a monitoring team, monitoring the incident analytic team, doing the analysis, and then passing into incident response and policy tip which further makes a recorded it of it for learning and reported to CISO and chief risk officer. So that's about cybersecurity on a nutshell. I will go to the next session. Should we take a break uh, before we get in the next session on skills? I think we're fine to keep going because we will take a break in uh, about 20 minutes. Um, this is a completely different section. So we started some one and a half hour back. Is it okay that we take like five minutes break so the speaker can have a glass of water or tea or something? Yes. Okay. Five minutes. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's uh, even fresh our mind because this is a new chapter we'll get into. That's great. All right, we'll be back in exactly, the back to start in five minutes, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm back. Yeah, it's funny how how um, how fast five minutes uh, passes. <laughs> um, we actually have a question for you, Sanjay. Yes. Oh, so, just one second. Hola, Mileko, are you here? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay, please go ahead with your question. Okay, um, my question is, um, I, I, I identified a security problem um, of an organization, a financial organization. Um, how do I pitch um, the security problem to the organization? And how do I, I am, how do I, how, how do I assess the um, ROSI, the ROSI uh, ratio of the security risk? And is it possible to profit from Alatna suggesting a, an improvement to um, an improvement to the security problem? Yeah. So essentially, uh, uh, or view, uh, you know, typically, if you go to any bank, they will have some level of maturity. Uh, and you will be entering a brownfield. So the best thing to do is getting into a dialogue with them. Uh, tell them what you can do and then learn from them and understand them what is the pain area. Uh, and they will invariably tell you the pain area uh, and ask you for a solution uh, in those uh, pain areas. There can be more than one pain area. It can be uh, and bank for bank predominantly confidentiality is, is up there. Uh, you know, the priorities are confidentiality, uh, integrity, and availability. Uh, so hence, uh, it has to be predominantly with data in, in most cases. And once you've identified them, then you can come up with a solution to the bank. Uh, as the next meeting you have with the bank. Uh, and in, in doing that, if you're using, let's say, I, I presume using RMF uh, framework of NIST, protect, decide, respond, and remediate. Uh, based on that, you can do come up with a solution. Let's say, protect what data? So you then do talk about data discovery and data classification. Detect what? Uh, detect uh, any compromise. Uh, so then you can have something uh, like a SOAR or, or an EDR or uh, some form of product which uh, does the detection uh, for them, uh, or 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 a CASB or a DLP which detects any any deviation of confidentiality uh, and uh, respond. So then you will have the, 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 uh, the SOAR, sorry, the respond will have the SOAR uh, in terms of uh, remediation action uh, and recover. Then you will have uh, the team which will come in and do, do the incident uh, uh, response and policy. So you will have to then classify depending on what framework you use. If you're using ISO framework, uh, then you will plan it accordingly and uh, categorize your solution accordingly. So that will be an effective way, uh, but I don't think so, uh, at least with whatever my head have uh, seen and my eyes have seen and my head has processed that uh, you just go in on the first meeting and do the solution. You, you have a discovery phase with the customer where you understand the customer uh, and customer understand what you can do. And then you both of you agreed to then go back and find a solution for what they want. And then you come back with a solution. Does that answer? Thank you very much, sir. Um, yes, for sure. Hamid asks uh, another question. He said, does penetration testing break a system and how is data protected during and after penetration testing? Yeah, so that's what I was pointing out. SANS a body which does uh, provide standards for uh, cybersecurity and penetration testing also. Uh, what they have defined is that uh, uh, once you do penetration testing and penetration testing is a way in which you look at the uh, loopholes a company might have, which might uh, uh, allow you to know and uh, your vulnerabilities and allow the, uh, the penetration pen tester or the red team uh, to ensure that they are able to access the network. So it is breaking into the organization, but ethically. And once you have done that, then you have a legal issue because uh, for some time you will have uh, some access to the data or you know, the data will be visible to you. You see it or not, but you're still having visibility. So you, what San says is before you do that, 
whichever department uh, you think you're going to do uh, the penetration testing because uh, in the world of uh, you know penetration testing and vulnerability management there is the security team there is a pen tester and there is an application owner and there's an IT that application owner permission is needed to be taken and IT permission is needed to be taken and with their consensus you move into the next step number one number two is you do the masking for the data so that even if the pen tester is able to penetrate the the asset of the owner of that asset or that part of network uh, he is not uh, you're able to see it and he is complying with the legal laws uh, which are meant that uh, you do not have access to the unauthorized access to the data so i hope that answers your question wait for Mohammed to confirm yes he says uh brown uh, monday egbe says how is data protected from internal data breach breaches in case in cases where uh, employees willingly sabotage their own company. Correct, and that is where you have the proactive security coming in. First thing we do is we make sure that uh, uh, we only give access uh, based on role, uh, so our back role based access control. So we we have that provision. Within that role-based access control, we have adaptive, uh, uh, you know, identity and access management put in place, which uh, makes sure that the uh, the user uh, profile access is 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 increased or decreased based on the perceived risk by the user. Then, once you have taken care of the identity and access management, you go to the next step. The next step is to make sure that uh, the data is protected data is encrypted and data is masked. The two scenarios, number one scenario is that uh, the uh, data is masked uh, so that even if the, the uh, malicious insider in this case is able to access that part of the database, he is not able to see any other data. The second thing is that we put encryption on top of it so that uh, you know the data is encrypted and even if he, he tries, he is not able to uh, you know get access to the data beyond a point. So that that is the way in which we do it. Um, we further make sure that if data is in transit, uh, we have uh, synthetic data which is used so that even if the address adversary gets over the gets the access to the data, the layer of the data he gets access to is synthetic, it's not the real data. Uh, and then we do provide uh, solutions like hashing and salting, uh, which provides another hash in, uh, in, on top of the data so that, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing cipher uh, 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 cryptography on top of data and you're muffling the data, or you're putting a synthetic data, he will not have any sense of what data actually was because it is having a layer of uh, cryptography put in top of it. So masking, uh, encryption, salting, and obfuscation are various techniques that we use at this side. And then we use role-based access uh, and adaptive identity and access on the uh, identity access side. Now, if this for some reason ends up being the admin or super user, then we have privilege access management, which uh, generates passwords every time, records a session so that we, we, we have a trace of this person. And then we bring on top of these two, uh, the principle of least privilege. So the damage he can do to the company is very limited. He will only have need to have access at all times uh, within the organization. So I hope that answers at a high level to your question. Could just confirm okay thank you Brown. no other questions for now all right so i'll move ahead then so what are the skills or uh, when i've taken a very high level view uh in terms of the skills uh, that we require um and um 
so basically uh, we have various skills if you're going in the area of monitoring you need a soc analyst uh, certification uh, which ec council offers isaca offers or a incident handler skill which ec council offers and of course there is no alternative to experience because even if you get a skill you need to practicing it cloud security uh, you know aws has the certification microsoft has the certification you go on the cryptography side i was just talking about cryptography it's a different field in itself uh, where you want to know about sha sha1 sha2 sha3 sha4 sha5 md5 fib standards uh, the caesar uh, uh, cipher and other ciphers elliptic non elliptic elliptic symmetric asymmetric cryptography then you either pick the firewall skills where you have cisco ccna ccnps uh, juniper checkpoint palo alto uh, f5 z scaler then you look at data security which uh, apart from complementing cryptography is doing data classification and discovery uh, as well and dlp cloud dlp cloud assurance security profile mm -hmm. go to the area of endpoint you're looking at antivirus email security uh, we are looking at dlp uh, we are looking at bitlocker disk encryption file encryption which is common to this but it is on the endpoint area email security and web security and we have identity and access management which has identity management access governance single sign on multi factor authentication uh privilege access management privilege privilege session manager end to end privilege access management uh etc so that that comes in uh, in this uh, area and now the password based passwordless authentication is another area then you have ecih ecih ethical uh, hacker which is um, also an area of course you have project management skills where you manage the project application testing you have sas das fuzzing uh, ias rasp uh, Uh, as an area where you can get into, then OT, IoT, and SCADA security, which had DCS, distributed control system, PLC, program logical controller, SCADA, human machine interface, etc. Securing this part, and the vulnerability management, we do vulnerability scan, vulnerability remediation, and other stuff. So those are some very high level skills that can be acquired uh, in terms of uh, security. and any question on this i'll be happy to take uh, or else i'll move forward so i'll move forward yes uh, no questions in the chat for now except if anyone has uh that's sanjay this is yunis again yes it, it, can you talk to us a bit more about um safety on our mobile phones because you mentioned that a bit um if you can uh, highlight on a few things for us because most of us have mobile phones and it could be good correct so mobile phones uh, typically uh, have uh, vulnerabilities which are coming into it uh, and we need to protect from it uh, one of course is we need to make sure that uh, we are uh, looking at uh, the network which we get access to uh, this doesn't require any additional tool make sure that uh, the network which we are connecting to is a web to connect, uh, a compliant network um, you know which can be uh, very very uh, important the second is if you are in public place like airport uh, and other rather thing we typically end up using our data cable to do the charging of the phone itself uh, but not many people are aware that the same data cable can be used once you charged it uh, to to hack into your phone so we we need to be careful about that it's advisable to use proper charging cable uh, to charge your phone in the public space uh, so that's the second thing the third thing is when you are downloading the software depending on what kind of uh, you know phone you have you have ios phone or you have a phone which is uh, from google uh, android um, so the difference is that uh, you know android uh, uh, this playbook uh that allows a lot of application to come and uh, some of these uh, assessment of security criteria are not up there as as iOS has uh, and uh, the way our phones work are based on 
uh, various level of authentication. So in the same phone, you have two or three application, your banking application also, and let's say an e-commerce application or some application, some free, um, or, you know, uh, application you have for photos or music or something. Uh, uh, they work on a layer of, uh, you know, authentication and they should not be talking to each other. But these, uh, these software, which you might have phone, might be either a spyware looking at your passwords or the other applications you have and can compromise your other application or uh, you know uh, get the access to these passwords uh, to the uh, uh, adversaries. The third is that phone can be breached by having uh, messages like SMS uh, or WhatsApp message uh, or even emails which you open or sites you open, uh, which you get an email saying that you have won a lottery of so much amount, open this document and that document would be uh, encrypted, oh, sorry, but will be, will be having some malware or a message you get SMS and you open that SMS and you might have some encrypted uh, or a mess or uh, a malicious message in that, and that can uh, release the malware. So you need to have some form of antivirus tool for your phone uh, to ensure that uh, the phone is protected as well. And if you are a corporate, then you have a mobile data management policy to make sure that uh, unauthorized uh, such sites and malicious codes are not allowed to be open. So that on a nutshell will be my suggestion for mobile security. Thank you. Yeah. If you are a corporate, you will have a policy defined. Uh, you will have uh, what sites to go, uh, you know, uh, the restricted site, uh, sites without uh, TLS encryption. That means the site is HTTP rather than HTTPS. They will not allow to open. For an individual, that policy enforcement uh, is something which has to be done at a personal level. And the awareness has to be uh, there. Also, one thing we need to remember if you're using a personal phone for your company and you have an MDM, mobile data management, like AirWatch on your this thing, the control will be your company that they can re, uh, reformat your phone at any point in time or reset your phone or delete any entry of your phone. So that's also, that's not a malware, but it's uh, something which is very much possible. So should I move ahead uh, then uh, the next slide? Yes, please. Yeah. So on the technical sales guide, um, um, the uh, skills for gaining knowledge. You have to have technology skills where more you understand of the latest technology, the more competitive you are. Uh, product side, what are the different products available? Uh, most product provide certification, Cisco provides its own certification, Zscaler provides its own Palo Alto, Juniper, Sipantec, McAfee provide your own certification. More you have knowledge on the offers and products, more certifications you have on that, that's good. Process side, technical process, how the integration with business process uh, is very important. Uh, NIST has a whole module, National Institute of Standard and Technologies on process itself. Uh, architecture is very, very important. What is the underlying architecture? Is it an ISO based uh, architecture? Is it a NIST based architecture? Is it Octiva based architecture? It's, uh, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, science based uh, architecture. And so that architecture is very important so that you know uh, where things are fitting in. Uh, similarly, the framework, uh, what framework, overall framework is it looking? Is it SASE framework? Uh, is it a zero trust framework? What's a kind of framework it is uh, residing in? The knowledge of those frameworks is also very important. Um, NIST has its own frameworks as well. Uh, and then of course you have the ISO framework 27001 and uh, Sans has, Octiva has, FAIR has its framework. Uh, and then there are policies, what, what is the uh, you know, policy organization has put in place for, for itself. Uh, we have also seen that uh, uh, depending on what kind of organization, if you're an electricity company providing electricity to critical infrastructure, you have to have a policy which is put in place. So if I put a patch uh, update and all, all my PCs are going to, or servers are going to get rebooted and those servers are also including the servers which are providing electricity to city or real network and they're also going to shut down 
then there is a problem. Then there has to be a standard operating procedure defined in the policy. Uh, that has to be defined so that people who are working know that they, what is to be done and what not to be done, not just from a security perspective, but also from a perspective of simple things like patches, like uh, updates, uh, uh, you know, or remote access, because it might shut down the service on the other side. So the policies, it has to be known and, has, and you have to be able to draft those effectively as well knowing all these smaller nuances of compliance, regulatory and business cases. So those are technical skills. The career paths you have uh, in this are technical roles and non-technical roles. You have a chief information security officer, which is uh, the head of security, security manager role, architect roles, SOC analyst role, incident response engineer role, which is very high in demand. Uh, analyst role, consultant role, compliance office and DPO. In fact, in Europe, by law, every organization has to have a data privacy officer by law. So, you know, it is not a choice. It is legally required to have a data privacy officer. If you have certified in this, uh, you're sure to get a job. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, a lot of requirement in the incident response space and analyst space. So, uh, in terms of even uh, you know retainer services, some of the big companies like RSA uh, offers retainer services only for incident response engineering, policy engineering. Of course, all of these are uh, also having a lot of requirement because, as I said, there's a huge gap in the skill pool available and the need in the industry. The non-technical roles: you can be a security product management person, coming up with new products and new services, defining new services when we're doing business development, sales, alliances, working with Cisco's, Juniper's, and others of the world, pre-sales, where you design solution, human resource uh, of hiring uh, resources. Um, a lot of companies like ours also have human resource account manager because large organization requires thousands of people to fulfill the, to the projects. So, and there's a constant uh, gap between attrition and fulfilling it. So there, there are human resource attached to each large account to ensure that people are groomed, trained, and hired regularly. And then they're hiring teams also uh, within large organization with their, with, with their functions, uh, within accounts uh, where there are functions as well, and within regions as well. Uh, any question on this part, uh, in this particular thing? If not, I'll move ahead. We have, could you raise your hand? Allow me to, uh, allow me like one. Um, okay, um, as a beginner in cybersecurity, which was, because as I can see this was, they look like something you need like five, seven, ten years experience in. So as a beginner, which, which roles can you get? You can get an analyst role. Uh, you can get a consultant role. Um, if you get a DPO layer, you know, certificate, you can get into this as well. Uh, you can get an architect role also there, uh, which is their incident response engineer role. SOC analyst is a role which uh, typically, or a SOC monitoring role, which which is the L1 role. So you typically have L1 role, L2 role, L3 role, L4. So you can start with the L1 role, which is doing the monitoring services. Uh, which sits in the SOC and does the monitoring. Uh, as a beginner, you can also be uh, an endpoint engineer who is configuring, configuration, configuring uh, antivirus. Uh, I, for one, started a similar kind of role many years back. Uh, so there are various such uh, options uh, which are there. So you have to see what you are trained in. For example, you're trained in Cisco or uh, you're trained in uh, Juniper or uh, which is a network side, you, you try to get into that area. I, in South Africa, had uh, a lot of people placed uh, for various projects in our uh, various projects in security, uh, which were in network side of it. What we did was uh, with that team that we agreed that we kept on learning so that they can keep growing. It's a company called Telcom in South Africa, Johannesburg, uh, where we, we started working many years back. So that kind of work also can be done. But you have to have a journey on whatever you pick because it is not uh, a destination. You pick that thing, uh, and then uh, you will be required to keep doing certification, uh, and which I have a slide for in that area. Does it answer your question, or do I need to explore more? This is important for you. Uh, thank, thank you. It, it does. 
All right. Okay. So uh, this is these things are important for me. I thought I'll put slides for this because all of you are going to be the future workforce um, internationally and in your countries. Soft skill and hard skills are very important. Uh, self management is very important. You will have situation where you will be bombarded with work and you have to manage yourself. Uh, and you'll be successful, not successful at times. Uh, success will eventually come, but you have to manage yourself. Uh, creative debates are very important at the same time, not being abusive. It is very important to have space for yourself and others to debate and have new ideas. All of us collectively can come up with a lot of good ideas. Only one person can only think so much. Group and teamwork is very, very important. So working together in team, uh, and, you know, managing such meetings in, in a teams is very important. You'll have many such meetings, just, uh, which is going to be common on Zoom or Teams. Peer-to-peer -peer interaction, how respectful we are with your peers and how good you know, relationship you, you and, and uh, repo you build is very going to, going to go a long way. Communication is very important. Different cultures, contextualization is very important. Reflection is very important. Uh, you'll always find yourself uh, in the heat of the moment uh, or thinking uh, that you are right, but it is important that you reflect. Uh, and then critical thinking is very important because uh, uh, you need to think, uh, you need to be inside inside yourself, but think uh, from a person who is observing yourself as well and others as well and do critical thinking. I'll further have uh, more emphasis on this thing because this is very crucial. Um, you have to work on communication, which I just mentioned, presentation skills, public speaking. Uh, you will be speaking in forums like this and large audience. Uh, your teams tomorrow to your management. It's very, very important that you're communicating, communicating to large audience and you develop that skills as well. Listening skills are very important. God gave us two ears and one mouth. So obviously he had a plan. He wants to listen to us to listen more and we need to listen to others and uh, be a good listener. Um, and this is again a skill. It, uh, it is not uh, that people are born with. Business etiquettes is very important. Um, communication, behavior, uh, and contextualization of culture, uh, dress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All those are very, very salient things, very important thing. Leadership, um, you know, in stable waters, everybody can be leader. It is in the disruptive waters where you need to show that leadership, and it is putting others in your team before you. Uh, obviously, taking care of yourself goes without saying. If you don't take care of yourself, you can't uh, take care of them. But you have to have this leadership skill develop, and most of the things are interdependent. Motivation, you need to have self-motivation and motivation to the other. Uh, you will have, this is a marathon, and it's a long marathon. You need to have skills uh, of motivating yourself. Teamwork, uh, recognizing the team, uh, and, uh, you know, Working as a team is very important. A writing skill is very crucial. You need, you might know technically a lot of stuff, but there are people who will not know that stuff. They will need articulation, uh, reports. So writing skill becomes very important. And executive presence, you should have some executive presence as you go up. Uh, and that also, you know, the more important thing is, uh, I see, is people should be um, uh, pleasant in interaction, but they should be also be some, somebody who people believe to be approachable. Sometimes you are quite good personality, etc., but you, you don't come across as approachable and people resist. And that is also a problem. So you need to make sure that uh, all those soft skills are developed and are very, very crucial uh, in creating impression uh, beyond technology. And how do we acquire these hard skills and soft skills? So experience and knowledge. Um, hard skills, of course, the project and leadership activities, uh, which we do in experience. Knowledge-wise, it's training and education, professional qualifications, participation in community events, and personal improvement. You cannot do anything. You can't learn swimming by reading. If you need to swim, learn swimming, you have to get into the water. 
you will not know ever what to do until unless you start doing it and that is very important so they are in experience and knowledge and when you start doing something you know what is missing and you start learning and i'll come to that slide in a moment project and soft skills you need to have project and leadership skills and self realization and correction uh if you don't self realize then it's a problem so you need to have a reflection time in your day you need to do little less work so that you can introspect if you only working then it's a problem because you will not have time for introspection so you need to give that space to yourself and then from a knowledge perspective training and education participate in community events and personal improvement that is very very important and become a personality uh, skill development is is uh, another very very important area experience ability growth advanced training knowledge learning competition training all go hand in hand in terms of skill skill development the hierarchy in terms of skill development starts uh, in terms of your student you need to know uh, acquire basic knowledge uh, and this is incompetence competency where you need to know what you don't know uh, and if you're an apprentice uh, you need to play you need to have motivation motivational use of knowledge now you know what you what you did not know and you need to start working towards it specialist is work you use whatever knowledge you have to for works or purpose uh, or use of knowledge you whatever you know it is to put in use and then if you have an expert you have use creative use of skills to resolve problems and solve problems and if you are a master or a craftsman then you invent you create new knowledge uh, skills products and service and leadership so that others to follow so this is noel birch four stage of competency model uh, we start with the conscious competence learning model where uh, you know we start with unconscious incompetency that means we do not know what we do not know uh, and uh, we think we know everything because we do not know so far what we do not the stage after this is we suddenly realize what we do not know so now we are move away from thinking that we know everything that hey i didn't knew this so this is a conscious incompetency now i need to work on this so we move into the next stage we try to acquire that competency and as i said you can't learn swimming without getting in water you need to know what you do know that itself is a big learning and then once you have acquired this become unconscious competency is like driving when you are learning driving it's so hard and then you later are able to you know do multiple activities you are able to talk well driving you are able to uh you know speak to somebody over phone etc etc so it becomes an in, unconscious competency because this is your second nature hence you go to the various stages lack of awareness stage which is unconscious competency go to awareness stage which is conscious competency and go step by step stage which is conscious competency and then skill stage which is unconscious competency where you know this thing but it becomes your second nature and it happens over time these are the various uh, certificates patient body uh, need not have to start day one some of my colleagues i suggest them to uh, go to free courses on edx uh, uh, and linda and other sites uh, which are available once you have done that then you start uh, looking at these ones and then the much longer list than i have mentioned these are uh, some of the highly respected certification certified information security professional cissp system security professional certified cloud security professional certified authorized professional uh, cclp certified secure software life cycle developer icsa is another one which has cism certified information security manager cisa which is certified information security auditor uh, cars certified in security and information risk control uh gceit is certified in governance of information security ec council has cc so certified information security officer ech certified ethical hacker cnda which is certified network defense architect ctia certified threat intelligence analyst and uh, p uh, cpnet which is certified penetration testing uh, some of these exam you have to prepare well it is continuous 6 hour exam this one uh which uh, it's an approximate is to have 700 questions earlier now it's brought down to 350 questions this one i cleared sometime back last year this again has 200 plus 200 odd questions 
so you, you need to do good preparation uh, in order to get into these, and they have four different modules uh, in, 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 in these to, to clear them. Any questions regarding the certifications? Yes, we have a question from Kuyet Jato. Uh, please, what is the most valuable cybersecurity certification to get in order to kickstart a career in cybersecurity? So it's a journey, you know, if I tell you, if I, I was a young boy and somebody told me, what do I need to do uh, uh, to do a career? And somebody told me to do a BTEC. Uh, obviously, it, it, it doesn't happen one day. It, it takes 14 years, 15 years, right? You go to nursery, KG, uh, and then uh, junior school, higher secondary school, and then into college and then pass. So uh, similarly is this, if you jump into it, you will be overwhelmed and you start with small. You pick some small courses, learn uh, those things, those subjects before you go into big. CISSP is pinnacle, of course. Uh, so you get into this and it's good, but uh, uh, it is costly as well. So better is to do some small certificates. If you go on these uh, these websites, you would know those small certificates. Even before that, I will say there are free courses on EDX, do those cases. Uh, before you jump into this. If you have already done those, then of course uh, you pick those courses, those exams. But as I said, I know a lot of people who, uh, you know, completely get disengaged from the world to prepare for these, uh, you know, for months. So you might say like the simpler courses, understanding basics and starting off from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because you know the once you pay the fees and you don't you show up for the exam the, or you don't pass it the fees is gone mm -hmm. All right so and then again so you have to pay for a certificate also after that yeah so you know better is to be very sure uh and then uh, give the exam that you are studied well you are you know their practice question papers uh etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, you will have your own strategy uh, and uh you know, once, but it is very important to know what you don't know. That means what all it takes. You know, for example, it has uh, uh, enterprise security as a module. It has uh, government risk and compliance as a module. So you need to start knowing about those modules. What are subjects different? But for example, in this exam, when I gave this exam, uh, in the training I did over time, it told that this exam will be more of the question. Uh, you know, one question can have multiple dimensions of the answer. So this question, when they ask who is responsible for cybersecurity, uh, and simple word will be security head. No, it is not. In their world, it is the board. So the way of which exam you're giving and for whom it is, it matters. But for them, this is for managers. So they look at from a management perspective. Accountability is different from responsibility. This is hand downs person. The exam answer will be different. So you need to know that. And you need to first get the fundamental clear. You will know that who is responsible, what is to be done. But then you need to know how to give the answer to the exam. And then of course there are you know master courses uh, which goes much beyond this is there. So what I learned in, in Liverpool in my post graduation goes beyond what you'll learn in certification. Okay, um, Kuyat said thank you. In terms of timing, we are 15 minutes away from our next break, Sanjay. All right, so I'll go to the next slide then. Uh, in terms of product and platform certification, I know a lot of people who, who do get jobs just because of these certifications. What companies need is somebody who is a uh, Cisco certified uh, CECP, uh, IE, or CCNP or PCNE. The, there are a lot of companies who need this combined with uh, somebody who knows Arcsight or uh, uh, QRADAR or Splunk uh, so that they can have uh, you know, incident response taken care of. So, uh, this is this is the meat of the thing because uh, when it comes to managing of these platforms and responding or incident response, these are these skills uh, which are required. Uh, and the list goes on. You know, you're going to manage a Symantec or a Palo Alto uh, or a you know a Checkpoint or a, um, Zscaler or a, a, you know Thai Thales. That and obviously this the they, they have their own list of certificates which are there uh, and those can be picked. Any questions regarding to product and platform related certification? Um, we have a question 
from Lindunda. Uh, she is, uh, she or he, sorry, is from uh, Zambia and studying information technology with cybersecurity at Zambia ICT College, currently in the third year and uh, would like to do some certifications, but uh, many of these courses are expensive between 100 and 400 US. Uh, the question is, do you know any sites that, can, that offer free certification? And if uh, a course uh, is taking at Udemy, for example, or on Udemy, can the certificate be considered as an achievement by employers? Hi, so, yeah. so first question is free size is EDX, so I, IIT, MIT, uh, Harvard, uh, Yale, all of them offer free courses on that, edx.org. Um, uh, so that, that's uh, one site. There are similar more sites uh, which uh, offers free courses. So Omidy of EDX would be a good place. Yeah, because they're all, if you get a certificate, you'll end up getting a certificate from MIT or some yep. big uh, college. Okay. Right. Um, the other thing is Umidi um, uh, or Coursera, obviously they, they offer courses. They don't offer certificates. Mm -hmm. uh, and they offer a certificate of completion. Yes. So we just bear that in mind. Uh, most uh, most companies should be okay with it. But, you know, uh, these the previous slide shows those are industry recognized ones. So they, if big companies will have these in their database. So if you, uh, you know, if you go into database and say, I am CISSP certified or CISM certified or CISS certified, they will have those names in the database. They might not have the name of Coursera or, uh, uh, you know, Omidy or the other ones. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But then your manager is, is important. I know for a fact that, uh, you know, when I was, putting people uh, for uh, uh, telecom in South Africa, the customer wanted specifically CCNA or CCNP person uh, with some knowledge of Toyota. So uh, the girls and boys I had uh, put on the project, we had discovered with the customer that they will work on the certificates. We promised him they'll pass the certificate later. Uh, and uh, and of course, uh, some, and they obviously eventually pass. Some, some companies uh, offer reimbursements. Um, so, you know, Cisco, for example, or, uh, you know, um, these companies, they have tie up with the employer. And uh, the scheme is uh, you, you, you study, we pay. That means uh, you paid for the, uh, uh, this thing, um, for the exam. But if you pass, you're reimbursed. They, they pay you for uh, the, you know, if you show the proof that you passed it. So those schemes are there in various things. So once you get employed, uh, you will going to find out. Obviously, if you have a situation where the employer says, I want this person with this skill, and uh, you have an understanding that uh, you will pass it over time and if he gives you an opportunity, that, that should, you know, then it will worth your investment because you'll be paid for that job and you can invest from the payment you get from your salaries. Or uh, you can figure it out. But Essentially, you have to pick one field uh, after your uh, graduation, uh, and then uh, you know whether it be network or cryptography or end-user computing, and then work towards that path. Um, one suggestion is try to do some small courses which are free of cost, and then once you have some confidence, uh, and then you, based on that, what kind of job you get because it is uh, it makes sense to get a job in an area and obviously. Uh, it, the job now is also like a business. You, know, you reinvest in yourself. The asset you're selling is yourself. You reinvest in that asset and get more skilled and you're more valuable. Yes, the responses. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So the next is the stepper model, uh, at a high level. Uh, you know what? You need to, in terms of you know, how would you achieve these goals? Because it's a continuous thing, uh, learning, uh, and you need to first have this identification of the goal, uh, why you need to learn, uh, and then target the identification at this stage. Uh, you look at the process, identify the desired goal, uh, which is to be specific, measurable, 
accurate, uh, realistic, and time bound. Uh, you can't have a goal which can be infinite. It has to be time bound. And then you have to have emotions. You know, you need to understand your emotion. What motivates you is very important. And perception. Try to see your goal from a broader view. Understand the meaning of your purpose. And it's important what specifically it means to you. Uh, if you're trying to, you should not get into something you don't like to do. Uh, then you would not go long way. And then plan. Once your target is set, uh, set your overall path for the, you know, the path you want to take. Uh, it is necessary to develop systematically and organize, uh, you know, various steps. Uh, you have to pace yourself. You, you know, uh, uh, if you choose to work and study after some time, so that you have uh, earning, real-time training. You are in the water. You know the depth of the water. You know what you need to learn from subconscious incompetency, the conscious competency. Then you need to say, pace yourself so that you don't burn out uh, and go towards your target. And action and amend, things will not go uh, always as you desire. Something will happen in personal life or something like extraordinary COVID. You need to realign yourself so that you don't lose sight of your goal. Uh, from a skill development perspective, uh, you know, you need to mobilize. Uh, action is very uh, important. Uh, and uh, then work towards development and then get a work in that area. Uh, vocational skill training is important uh, online or uh, on premise for employment in the country where you live or for studies beyond what you're doing or employment beyond you're doing internationally. So the skill gap identification is important. If you choose cryptography, you need to identify the gaps you need to fulfill in cryptography. If you choose network, you need to identify the gaps and you need to have a plan uh, for let's say 25, 30 years, you need to do that. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, make sure that you have those steps identified. Uh, you might not know everything, so we might need a mentor at some stage. Uh, select the trainings you will have to have. We were just discussing. Uh, make notes, make uh, these various platform known to yourself uh, so that uh, you, need, you have a path for every training you want to pick up uh, and you just end up into the training. And then over time, do the skill development in those areas. On the job training is nothing like that. Uh, you know, when you are actually doing that configuration, uh, mm -hmm. there is no substitute uh, to this. Um, and mentoring and continuous development, find a mentor for continuous development. And of course, you're more employment uh, ready thereafter. In terms of uh, skill development, um, you have the focus zones uh, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, various areas, the impart, improve, evaluate, evolve, and enable. Uh, you have the technical level, the managerial level, and the leadership level. Uh, here uh, we have the enables, you will have soft skills, which are, um, you know, in terms of outbound and process orientation. Uh, and then you have technical skills, you have industry orientation, uh, organization objective, job specific skills, uh, role orientation, industry benchmark, and professional uh, prospects. From a managerial skill, you need to be agile and open for change management, uh, innovation, idea generation, uh, industry best practices, professional orientation, and uh, trend adoption. Things change very fast and need to be adaptable. Uh, we may also need to be industry aligned, uh, banking as against uh, Manufacturing as against uh, oil and gas might require different uh, orientation as well. Uh, and uh, that has to be also looked at from a managerial perspective. From a leadership perspective or CXO perspective, uh, one mentoring is very important. Uh, experience sharing and cross industry experience uh, is very important. Geographical trends is important. Uh, the market operations, initiatives, success stories, uh, the uh, the vision uh, and the mission is also very important uh, as well. So that's uh, uh, from you know the three perspective of focus on personal enablers for the skill development. Uh, the advantage you have with this is uh, expansion of knowledge base. Uh, you will have uh, Good knowledge, you'll know what knowledge to expand, expand to. You know, greater professionalism 
uh, you'll be exposed to more professionalism, you'll be good in the area of work you do uh, and be very thorough. Uh, improve in people quality and service. Uh, this will ensure that you know you have good quality and uh, the services are uh, better for the employer. Uh, you will have job satisfaction and growth because you'll be happy doing what you're doing and eventually lead to growth. And you'll lead to improvement uh, in the employment employability uh, for uh, uh, for you uh, in the market. So that's uh, from the skill development perspective. I'll pause here for any questions. No questions right now. Um, we have five minutes to the break. Would you want to take the break? now or um depends on what's left in the in yeah i think we i plan for three hours and three hours will be done in another 10 minutes uh, i will be ending up my slide i think in the next slide after this okay so i i think we need another break uh the, the would everyone want a break right now if you could just indicate in the um chat box Uh, while you're indicating in the chat box, I have another question. Please indicate if you want to go on a 10 minute break and then we'll get to these questions. If you could just, okay. So we have uh, Bukisu needing a 10 minute break because then that would be our last stretch. So I just need one more person to confirm uh, if you would like a break. 10 minutes? Okay. All right. So um, just before we go, we can take the question uh, after the break. That's fine, Sanjay. Um, thank you. We will be back in 10 minutes and take the last stretch. See you in 10 minutes. Everyone. Welcome back everyone. If you could just give me an indication that you are here in the chat box, we wanna be sure you're still wide awake and with us and you're different time zones in the world right now. So yes, Hamad is here. Tell me you're here, we wanna be sure you're with us. Everyone is jumping in now. Oh, oh, is here. Well, let me let go. I decided to call you. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, Kuyet is here. Brown is wide awake. All right. <laughs> In UAR. <laughs> oh, Mercy is here. Excellent. Okay. All right. So let's, um, we're going to go back uh, over to you, Sanjay. Yeah. All right, so I'll go to the next slide. So just now uh, a recap on what we did so far, or we discussed uh, you know, four few tips. Um, start from the basic uh, in cybersecurity, look at all controls, the policies, the assets uh, you need to protect, uh, understand the stakeholders, team, Develop a culture of cybersecurity in your organization, uh, and the ways find out the ways to combat the the, uh, the various uh, vulnerabilities or various threats. Strategize for the safety and privacy. Uh, make sure that uh, you have uh, privacy by design principle put in place. Uh, various safety controls put in place. You have the buy-in from the right stakeholders. Right from the managers to the uh, to the uh, leaders to the owners of those areas, and make your critical system resilient in terms of having proper VCP DR uh, put in place, skill and competent team in place to take care of those vulnerabilities and those uh, risks to those areas. From uh, from the skills perspective, transformation perspective, uh, work on be ready. Uh, you know. Uh, make sure that uh, when an opportunity meets you, 
you are uh, ready for it uh, in terms of your skills, capability, behavior, and competency. And this will help you, you know, uh, grow, uh, sustain, and cement yourself in the mm -hmm. environment within which you will work and the situations which you will be exposed to. Uh, work on emotional intelligence that will play a much bigger role than anything else. Uh, you know, when dealing with people, uh, it will be more about dealing with people and then of course skills will uh, come into picture as well. Uh, your personality traits are very important. Work on those personality traits as well. Uh, work on learning. Uh, and learning itself, it's, it's, it's a complete syllabus in itself, how to learn and continue learning. Uh, adapt and learn functional skills in the areas you have and uh, develop physical and cognitive abilities. So that's uh, some of the suggestions uh, I have in terms of the overall uh, this thing, uh, you know, talent, uh, skills and security. Uh, and this is the last thing I want to add the five most efficient, efficient cybersecurity defenders are anticipation, education, uh, detection, reaction, resilience. Uh, and do remember cybersecurity is much more than IT topic. It is about all of these uh, factors. So with that, I am coming to a conclusion uh, on my slides uh, and I will be open to any questions which we have. Uh, or any any you know inputs that's required. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjay Vaid. Um, we have one question here. Uh, yeah. Is there any study groups that you can recommend or you could recommend for beginners? Yeah, so for beginners, uh, um, I will suggest to go to EDX. If you are on LinkedIn, reading uh, LinkedIn has uh, Linda. Linda has a lot of courses. Uh, as well, which are free of cost. That will be a, a good uh, start point to go on. Somebody mentioned Umidi. Umidi courses are very cheap, uh, cost-wise, uh, affordable. That will be uh, another good area. Um, look at, uh, you know, uh, books, uh, which are available on uh, these various, you know, certification I talked about. They have uh, their examination books for question papers they have uh, so that you can prepare for those uh, as well. So those are top of the mind uh, things uh, I can uh, recommend. Could you please, uh, for the first one, you mentioned Linda, could you spell that out please? Or just type in the chat. L-I-N-D-A. Oh, Go Lin to LinkedIn, LinkedIn Learning. LinkedIn Learning. Oh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn has, oh. Yeah, LinkedIn. LinkedIn Learning. Okay. The platform is called Linda. Uh, and uh, they have a lot of courses. So all this CompTIA, CompTIA exam or uh, the exam for CSSP, uh, CSM, they have various. Uh, there is also one more uh, site called uh, Cyberary. Cyberary is a subscription. So if you have used Netflix and if you watch Netflix uh, uh, or uh, Amazon Prime, uh, like you have movies on that, they have courses for these exams on that. So when you subscribe, instead of watching movies, you watch videos of training. Cyber. Cyberary. S-Y-B-C-I-B-E-R-A-R-A-Y. Cyberary. A-R? A-Y. Cyberary. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so those are, I'll just relook at Cyberary, but those are some of these, uh, 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 you know, sites uh, uh, I will recommend. Okay, uh, we can still keep our questions coming in while we go to- Yeah, the I'll just put in a mail, S-E-Y-B-R-A-R-Y dot I-T. Okay, excellent. Yes, please. Uh, could you please stop sharing, Dr. Vaid? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So oh, uh, please keep the questions coming. Um, I'm going to put back my video. Uh, keep the questions coming, and um, we will now go to our uh, post poll. 
before we go to the closing statements of the day. But as I said, you can still keep the questions coming in. We, we still have time to address any of them. Uh, just in case you are, you are curious, if you registered for this event on Eventbrite, you will get the material. So uh, that's right, Dr. Reid, right, Sanjay? That's correct? Yes. Yes. So the material will be ready, so both the slides and the recording will be made available to you if you uh, you uh, registered on Eventbrite and attended uh, the session. And um, we're just going to launch the second poll right now to get an idea of where we are, of where we are with... So I'm going to just as a way of reminding you, share the results of the first poll, okay? When we started out, um, we had medium and low levels of knowledge. Um, you found that the topic of cybersecurity was extremely relevant uh, and some had relevant. Um, you were likely to take precautions for your online safety, uh, likely to, somewhat likely and a little likely. Your gender identity, the, the, the males were more. And of course we had um, uh, participants from Asia and Africa. So I'm going to launch the second one. In just a minute, just one second. So now you have more or less the same questions. I'd like you to please take a minute to answer. Waiting on our participants to answer. I have no answers yet. Just waiting for you to vote. Okay, we're coming up. Oh, where did all the ladies go? <laughs> I know there are ladies out there. At least I can, I, I think I can see you. Uh, okay, knowledge, levels of knowledge have uh, gone up. I'm just waiting before I share the results. It's going to give you exactly the same time that you had before. Ah, a lady finally jumped in. So we're taking the post poll. Um, could you please, if you just entered, just take the poll as well. I'm waiting on a couple of people. Well, one person, I think. Of those here, we're taking a representative sample. Uh, Bilkisu, can you confirm if you have the poll? You can confirm in the chat if you can't speak. Because it's taking long. Okay, looks like. Yes, excellent. All right. So I'll just be ending the poll so that we can see the results. All right. Let's share the results. So um, pretty much the same at the beginning. So we're, we're quite interested in this. Your levels of knowledge have increased. Uh, this will also be shared with our partner and facilitator. Um, how relevant. So we've really like jumped 
pretty high in that about how relevant cybersecurity is, your likelihood. Hmm, interesting. Because I noticed there was Europe. So uh, this is an interesting one, Sanjay. Olani Lecon said, and I'm going to tell everyone what you did. <laughs> um, he hacked the poll integrity. He says he supplied the wrong location. The good thing is that we do have uh, backup data through our event, right, which is data triangulation. So you supply the wrong location. Maybe our location could have been detected automatically. Is this something that is uh, uh, possible, say, on Zoom? Depending on the configuration, it is possible, yes. Okay. So it's a lot to do with settings. Fortunately, we yeah. have uh, your name. <laughs> we have your names and, and location. All right. So uh, thank you very much for participating in the polls. I will just also share my screen now. One second. All right, because we are coming to the end. Um, as you can see, this is what we had planned uh, for the end. I'm just gonna give uh, just give the floor to to um, Eunice to give the closing remarks before we say our big 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 thank yous to Dr. Sanjay Vaid. Uh, over to you, Eunice. Yeah, thank you for all of you staying over. I know that you still, uh, you're still working really hard to get your uh, internet data up and running, and uh, it wasn't uh, easy, especially for those of us living in Africa. Um, I just want to say that thank you, Dr. Sanjay, for um, being on this uh, with me. Um, what we are looking at is bringing expert industry uh, information to um, to the youth, so that they can better um, they can better make better decisions about their, about their cyber security and information that actually you wouldn't easily have access to. And I think that we have actually uh, um, been able to do that today. Um, I want to thank everybody who made it a purpose to sit for three hours. That's a long one um, to, to learn and to be part of this uh, amazing uh, um, conference. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Ewe, I call you Ewe, for, for making this possible. I am far away in Norway, so it's quite a distance, but we were able to do this and you really, really done a good job. And, and I'm so proud um, to be part, a, part, a partner with you in this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eunice. Um, we're going to, I mean, Inasai is, uh, even the name is so classy, you know. Uh, Inasai, thank you so much for supporting us and uh, being there for us. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, we cannot thank you enough. Like you just kept on and on. And I think you're even stronger than all of us watching, watching, <laughs> listening. And we are so privileged. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this and not just being a part, but actually leading. And we're hoping to work with you even more in the future. Uh, you can actually find Dr. Sanjay Vaid on, on LinkedIn, but of course, uh, to reach him, you the, uh, I'm just gonna show you the connection details uh, and how to reach InnoSci. Uh, but before that, I would just like to get some feedback from you on the chat box, like tell us, uh, you know, what was good, what we can improve the next time. And if you could also recommend other people, not by name, but maybe by email, recommend other people who could benefit from sessions like this, STEM related sessions and programming, that would be great. So I'll just give you a minute to give us some feedback as well as any contact details of those who would be able to benefit from similar programming. And please don't feel shy to tell us that, you know, your hair was not standing straight or anything, feel free. Feedback helps us to improve. So if you tell us what we can improve and what went well, what you really liked, 
that would really be helpful. Yes, to add to Safiya, uh, every feedback is priceless. So it helps us to be better and helps us to move forward in the right direction. So feel free to share with Safiya what, if you have any contacts or organizations that could be of benefit, please share it with her. And while you're doing that, I will just put back the slide that has our contact details so you can see the contact details for EWI. Uh, that's our website and an email to, to contact us. You can find us everywhere, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, Pinterest, Pinterest, I heard is the right way to pronounce, and Tumblr. And with InnoSide, this is the, the uh, website. The contact email is hello at InnoSide. Uh, com, and you can find Inasai on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So uh, if you have any inquiries, feel free to, to reach out to us. As I said before, if you registered on Eventbrite and attended, you will receive the materials for um, the session. So I'll just leave this on for one more minute. Put a hand up for TechnoSpark, I'm not sure. Just one second. Uh, Okay, please go ahead. Uh, TechnoSpark is Jeremiah, I think. Just go ahead if you have uh, anything you would like to say. Nothing? Okay. You can also always uh, put that in the chat box. If you can't speak, you can always put that in the chat box as well. Lots of appreciation for Dr. Sanjay. I like this one, you're an embodiment of knowledge. Every single minute of the three hours was worth it. it was very thank, you very, thank you very much. All right. Um, I'll leave this uh, slide on while aware if we would like to to leave. Okay, so Techno says thanks, Doctor. Uh, Doctor Sanjay, do you have any closing remarks? Anything you would like to add? Yeah, so thank you very much for this opportunity. This area has a lot of opportunity for everybody. Uh, it's a journey. Follow the journey. Uh, be honest to yourself. Be um, ask yourself tough questions so that. Uh, uh, you get honest answers uh, and uh, follow that uh, answer uh, to move from a uh, you know a, a unconscious uh, incompetency to a conscious competency, uh, incompetency and conscious competency. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the best. Excellent. Um, for one last thing, I'm going to ask. Um, if you are able to put on your video, could you please do that? If you are able to do that, we want to take a nice photo and say bye-bye and actually wave bye-bye to one another. So if you're able to, it's going to be very fast. If you are able to, I know that the, you know, internet is a challenge. Oh, I can see all the faces. Amazing, amazing, amazing. <laughs> See if we can see everyone. I'm gonna take it in like the next minute or so. Excellent, Kuyat, Techno, Bilki, Supranit. This is so good. Almost there. Yes. Almost there. Our hacker. <laughs> Let's see you. <laughs> All right, two more people. Let's see if you can do it. Come on. Bilkiso, I'm sure your hair is fine. <laughs> it's the same. Oh, Mendy, it's you. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have to take it now because we, we're not sure. Okay, so we have a nice photo that will also come to you. Hair is not looking good. Okay, Praneet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. You will hear about um, other events and uh, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank
Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.